<laughs> You're really doing it. I can't All right. You did it. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Alpha Alpha podcast. We're so happy you're here. We are live right now and every week, uh, Wednesdays at 5 p.m. PST. Thank you all for joining us and spending some time with us. If you're listening to the podcast, which comes out Friday mornings, consider uh, making the jump and listen to us live Wednesdays mm-hmm. at 5 p.m. PST. Um, we're also live on Twitter today for the yeah, first buddy. time. So welcome all Elon bots. We're happy to have you here. Elon, sorry, we meant X. I know you're <laughs> yeah. sensitive about that. We're live on X. If, if you're new here, uh, we're two investors, two entrepreneurs trying to find some alpha and money and meaning. And this is uh, a conversation of four friends in, in search of that. So, And we're going to have a few drinks today along the way. Today we are Eric Johansson, Armand Asadi, Steven Cesaro. I'm Nick Urbani. And it's been few months since we've all been together boys so this dude, feels it's good been a minute nice to have you back dude yeah the, yeah. the energy no, you and nick yeah and both of you at the same yeah, time yes. though. And i me. think you took more time off yeah steven yeah. we're gonna miss steven next week first time he's gonna miss an episode i think in 200 no he's missed a couple i missed tulum yeah. oh yeah that's right all right so let's um let's give a shout out to the chat everyone who's joining us i see tunsky i see feach i see matt What's up, everybody? See Wait, vibes. Matt, Matt's here? Yep. He made Jack. it? Matt's live from the... I'm live from the freaking plane? United Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah he's on <laughs> the United Wi-Fi. Really? Wow. I want to ask our YouTube community... <laughs> well, legend. it's really our alfalfa community. Like, I'm curious if they prefer watching on YouTube because they're obviously used to that. But I'm curious if they jump on X, what the experience is like for them. Yeah, and how so it compares. Uh, the Techno Kings may strike again. Not sure if it's even working right yeah, now, but true. we're glad you joined us if you are. So uh, real quick, all the links are at uh, alfalfapod.com, including the Discord, which is probably like the most valuable thing uh, about this podcast, I imagine. Um, Lots of good fun in there. Uh, Money channels, politics channels, life channels, and some Easter eggs in there if you could figure out how to find the threads. Best place on the internet, TM. I think so, TM. That's a good shirt. We should make that shirt. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Yeah, we need merch. The weed emoji. Yeah. All right, Eric... uh, What are we drinking today, my friend? So today we have some Woodford Reserve. This is a special edition commemorating the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby. Oh, wow. The fastest two minutes in sports. (laughs) That will be, uh, it'll be on uh, May 4th or 5th. So in one month. Okay. Is that on your guys' like list of sporting events? I love it so much. Have you been? No. But you're into it. I'm into it. I like handicapping horses. I always wager. I always wager. This is your Formula One. Yeah, I think so. Like, <laughs> I would, I would love for us to do a trip out there because I've never that. been to Kentucky. I it's just a that. shit show. Drink some good bourbons. You got to get dapper. You wear some linen. <clears throat> yeah. Wait, on are you like a handicapper? Like you, you just bet on the names. Uh, no, but my my ex girlfriend uh-huh. used to like raise horses, so her family would tell me which one to bet on. Ah, uh, yeah, the trainers. And they were like, they were always hitting every time. <laughs> I want to go to the uh, to the Ryder Cup. That's on my uh, checklist of sporting events to go to i just watch full rider cup is sick masters Fools? baby yeah yeah masters i'd rather go rider no. way more rider cup come it's, on no because i i just want to wear the stars and bars and get degenerate so i watched full swing uh documentary that came up and i didn't realize how important to the golfers the rider cup is like they are thinking about it from the start of the season if they're on the bubble how can they get points to lock themselves in and uh yeah i like the whole america versus europe europe won last year right oh last yeah last time we, we got our we got our arses whooped um, all right, cool. Well, let's give a shout out to our sponsors real quick. Uh, first one, Zbiotics. Go to zbiotics.com slash alfalfa. Uh, Zbiotics is probably oh, some of the shit, best. I forgot to take a Zbiotics. Ooh, do you come on, man. Yeah, it's, it's in, the, in the desk <laughs> if you want to go right get that. some. <laughs> wow. All right, well, if that isn't the best commercial I've <laughs> yeah, ever that's seen, a pretty good too late, He's brother. leaving the podcast. You're toast. He's done for. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some of the best alpha we've had on this podcast and we, uh, partnered up with them and they've been supporting this podcast for a long time now. We're happy to have them. So it's the, uh, pre-alcohol drink. It's a probiotic you drink before you drink. Which is why Steven messed up. Yeah. He messed up. Pre-alcohol drink. He still might be saved. Yeah. He still might be saved. Yeah. Make sure you don't feel like shit in the morning. And so if you're kind of like to get after it sometimes, but you like to be healthy, like to stay in the gym, uh, Zbiotics helps you kind of stay on that track. And um, I'd like our new listeners to know that it actually has been working for us and a lot of people in this community for a long time. And a lot of people assume these types of uh, 
you know, um, I don't even know what to potions? call it. Potions? Potions yeah. just are futile and, and don't work, but they really do. They make you feel a lot better. Yeah, we fully, fully dependent. Yeah, this yeah. is this is science, not hocus pocus. Yeah, yeah and we met the. We, we actually interviewed the founder. Interviewed yeah. the founder. Um, got a chance to meet him. Great dude. Incredibly smart. Off the charts. IQ smart. And uh, anyway, uh, go check it out. Get fifteen percent off your first purchase. Uh, Zbiotics.com slash alfalfa. And then uh, last up, we got uh, Magic Spoon. So uh, we got some Q2 goals coming up. You know, I'm kind of a little anal about the Q2 goals. So the, the spreadsheet is. Is and made the, and the Q3 oh, yeah. goals and the yeah no we're not at Q3 the... yet we just finalized the Q2 goals and uh, we're being measured uh, as first week of being measured and uh, yeah Magic Spoon is one of those things that can help you stay on track live a healthy lifestyle so um, we have a few flavors here we got uh, cocoa fruity peanut butter and what's the other one frosted the one I'm holding mm-hmm. so these ones have uh, zero grams of sugar 13 14 grams of protein and four to five grams of net carbs. So if you go to magicspoon.com slash alfalfa, you get five bucks off your purchase. See if you like it. See if the kids like it. If they don't, they'll just give you your money back. No questions asked. So thank you, Magic Spoon, for supporting this podcast. Okay. So Hold on. Gonna... Thank you, Rectum, by the way. Whoa, really? What do we got going on? <laughs> $69 donation from Rectum saying, tonight's <laughs> podcast brought to you by Rectum's Quads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. His 30-inch Re- quads? Re- Rectum is just, I a, estimated, just a full-blown sponsor. Can I just say, <laughs> I <laughs> estimated, <laughs> yeah, I estimated his quads to be 28 inches uh-huh. in the Discord today. Like based on picture? Just, you know, imagination. <laughs> yeah, okay. you have, um, have an insane knowledge of, yeah. of quad girth. Quad circumference. <laughs> yeah. And... 30 inches. That's like remarkable. Wow. That's like a professional bodybuilder. I have no concept. Bold of you to wear these quad. holy jeans when you're talking about quad Thank girth. you for drawing uh, <laughs> attention to the jeans. I was hoping uh, the bankless account would, would notice, uh, <laughs> <laughs> David. Um, and curious what you what you think of the jeans this week. A uh, little extra, extra exposure. This is a thirst trap. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, insider intel for those of you. Well, that, you're you're marketing to our about. target persona. I don't know if Rectum knows this, but he is our target persona. We make this podcast for. Ooh, yeah, um, he's. I don't know if people notice, but he's the ghostwriter behind the Twitter account, which pops up occasionally. Uh-huh. Um, Shh. We're, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Did you know? Did you guys notice that we like in our intros channel? Like when new people come to our Discord, people say like, "Hi, I'm new yeah. here. I come from Bankless." And Rectum goes, "Hi, I have large quads." <laughs> That was yeah, his greeting today. was like, thank you for the warm welcome, <laughs> except the quads guy. <laughs> it was amazing. I was laughing so hard. That is the perfect introduction to the community, though, because anything less than that would just be like too normal. You got fun, we're smart, not normal and then the straight up outlandish we're that makes normal. it a good time. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, we're going to do something a little fun today. Uh, we found a funny video on the internet, as people do, and uh, we're going to refill our drinks, or at least I am. And while we're doing that, let's play the funny video, and then that'll get right into our first topic. Go ahead, Jimmy. Hit it. Good Good morning, morning, doctor. doctor. Good morning. (laughs) We got your ether scan back and unfortunately (laughs) we found (laughs) some. What is it, Doc? You've been diagnosed with ETH maximisis. You're an ETH maxi. An ETH maxi. Doc, that's not possible. It's okay. He's going to take some time to process this. He can only handle 10 alphabets per second. He has been really slow lately. <laughs> Is he allergic to anything? To any wallet that isn't MetaMask. Allergic to good UI. <laughs> any difficulties while digesting? He couldn't digest the fact that Austin Federa went on bankless. But is he going to be okay, doctor? I'm going to need to run some more tests. What do you see here, Nathan? (laughs) What are you doing? What? I'm just booking a cab with a decentralized application on Ethereum Layer 1. See? It's five minutes away. He's seeing fully functioning consumer apps and white papers. That's stage (laughs) three of ETH Maximizes. What does that mean, doctor? Do you see all of this gas in his transactions? It's only a matter of time till he gets wrecked. There must be some here. We can reduce gas if we use wormhole and bring him into the Solana ecosystem. Exposure to real apps that actually work can cure him. But we must act quickly or he'll progress to stage five. What happens in stage five? That could be fatal. 
That's when they start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Quick! What's happening, Doctor? It's a common reaction faced by these Maxis. They can't function without another layer. Layer three. <laughs> layer four. Layer four. <laughs> Every day, millions of devs suffer from ETH maximisis. <laughs> Extend them a helping hand by guiding them to Solana, uh, where not, they can create it's not just devs. Oh steps. no! Ultimate <laughs> punishment. Oh. All right, let's wait. That is a slam dunk. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> it's honestly a slam oh, dunk shit. bit. Uh, I feel personally attacked by that. Oh, wait, first of all, wait, which one of bad. us is most afflicted with ETH maximisis? Ooh, might be you. I think it's me and Nick. Yeah, I think it's you too. I think if you look at our percentage of portfolios, yeah, I own, the, I own the most Solana, right? Well, probably you on, both. Both so your percentage of portfolio here. What is your percentage? I mean, it's, God, it's like probably like. 40% of my portfolio God, now. That's way, oh, wow. yeah. that's way more yeah. than me. It just keeps going up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everything everything on there keeps going up. Nick, what's your Solana percentage? Because I want to I want to determine who's the most ETH max between Ooh, you and I. I can pull up the sheet, but I'm pretty sure it's like a little less than 10%. Oh, fuck. Oh, that's close. I'm going to need, need more blankets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucked. Yeah, you're heavy. I'm you're so heavy. heavy. I'm so heavy. Yeah. Dude, so, uh, so, so that was, I think that was for uh, Wormhole, right? So Wormhole had their airdrop today. and Oh, you can claim it? Okay, so... You can't be in the U.S. to claim dude, it. Dude, this sir. this airdrop was insane. So a long time ago in 2021, instead of using the Wormhole bridge to bridge to like two of my Solana wallets, I decided to route the transactions through FTX instead. And... That oh. airdrop would have been sixty thousand dollars on those two wallets. This is a huge air. They airdropped you on Solana. They airdropped you on Ethereum. They airdropped you from from Terra and Cosmos. Like everything. Like anywhere you bridge, they airdrop you to the wallet you bridge from and to your. So Solana this thing's wallet. trading right now because I I was eligible for yeah. some. Yeah. Ooh, eleven percent. Nice job, sir. Yeah. Really? But not because I initially like put in eleven percent. It also just. Why not? Yeah. Well, it's way oh, more than me. That's a good point. I mean, like, I don't it, know what it's they at. just they just keep airdropping just just bangers. Are you counting the whole all ecosystem? Solana ecosystem? No, that's just Soul. Just Soul. You uh, might have more. I yeah. Oh, well, no. If I add the memes, do I include the Costco hot dog? Yes. <laughs> okay. Hot dog. Yes. <laughs> okay. Here's We're the investment thesis. 50. It must go to a dollar fifty. It literally <laughs> must. It has to. It literally must. <laughs> So um, that's my favorite kind of thesis. It's good. By the way. Everybody buy my hot dog bags, please. <laughs> when do you sell? A dollar forty nine. No, it's like a mind <laughs> game. Like people, are, like everybody's I'm like, selling a ninety nine. No, no, I'm cents. selling a dollar forty, and then no, like, I'm I'm selling a ninety nine cents. Yeah, but yeah. I think that's what everybody thinks they're doing. But then, then, then we're all just 99. might as well not even buy it then. Like you guys are all gonna front run each other at like seventy four cents. It's gonna <laughs> so dub then, and it's gonna rip to like right, a dollar thirty immediately. Give yeah. us the game theory optimal play then. Here. And then it's gonna turn into a meme because a cost, Costco hot dog is gonna be worth nine ninety nine. <laughs> and then it's just gonna. Yeah. They are they <laughs> are slated to get a price increase. Yeah, that's inflation, although it could be baby. the end of. Ho it's of, gonna be of the Costco. ultimate ultimate resistance. Like yeah. never before has like a resistance level been as interesting as a dollar yeah. fifty on the uh, Costco hot dog meme. Yeah, it's so I, I hope it gets there. It's gonna be fast. Okay, but <laughs> where where is the game theory optimal? Like, I, I don't know. Like, I I was just, I trade dollars. I trade like price action. So yeah, wherever it. That's what I'm saying. We're selling it like a dollar, initially. Yeah, sure. Price action, same yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> this is uh, what I do. I go dollar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Feels good. Feels right. Um, I want to talk about uh, where we are in the cycle. Uh, we're six months in. I feel like it's good. Good check-in point. We so, talk about crypto every, every week, but uh, maybe a little broader convo, see how you guys are feeling in general. Uh, in a few weeks, Eric and I are going to talk to a group of financial advisors. I don't know why they chose us, but uh, <laughs> about about just the general crypto markets. And I imagine it's going to be a bunch of normies being like, so what the fuck is this? We're going to lead off with N-wordless cage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, so we're going to give an overview of like, I imagine we're going to talk about where we are on the cycle, so this will be a good convo to have to, to prep us. I'd like to talk to you about a coin called Black People Don't Recycle. <laughs> oh, my God. 
This thing is guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen is referring to a, a meme comment from a meme video. I didn't make video. the meme. I just invested in it. <laughs> Gotta give some context with these comments. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. It's fine. You're demonetized. <laughs> you're descaled. You're out. Um, so where are we in the cycle? I mean, I think this cycle's already been. It's already a pattern breaking cycle uh, to some extent, yeah. right? Because we're we've hit all highs at least on Bitcoin uh, before the happening, and that's that's something new. And I think that's a pattern break to at least point out. Um, the ETF was obviously the catalyst, but. It seems like most cycles have had, at least the part that's similar is most cycles have the first like six months. It's that like smooth write up, nice and easy. Most of the easy money, most of the easy returns are are here, and we might be entering that part where it's it's not so easy. And the fact that lots of bear traps, bull traps, like fucking you know nasty pullbacks. I think last cycle had maybe three to four, thirty percent pullbacks somewhere around there. So I don't know. It feels like at the point where I'm confused. we're due for one and I we have might so have so many a few. questions. What do you got questions about? So many questions. Do we have six months left in the cycle? Do we have 24 months <laughs> left in the cycle? I feel like that's the spectrum. What to if me. there is no cycle? What if there is no cycle? Uh, what What's the opposite of a super cycle? <laughs> <laughs> what if there's like, what if there's six years left in this cycle? I mean, that's the, the yeah. Roaring that's, 20s, sir? That's what I'm, that's kind of where i'm are like, meme yeah. coins going to continue to be a narrative in this cycle are people memed out will meme coins become the meta meta meme of the entire cycle will there really be a base jump off celebration party of 100 million people entering onto base from their coinbase accounts will the coinbase smart <clears throat> wallet like actually be what it's uh been uh sort of marketed and promise to be. I have, so many, I have so many questions about where this is going. Will NFTs ever come back? Will actual coins with utility ever matter? <laughs> These are all you good know, questions. Like, dude. Yeah, let's I, go I, to the next topic now. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do it. We just like, ask questions. God, it's a lot. It's a lot. I know you've been thinking about it. Come on, don't tease me. Dude. Yeah, I think about it all day. It's okay. my freaking job. So let's start with, with let's start with the basics. Do you think uh, people are memed out? No. No. Well, the, the basics is like, the question one is like, is the cycle over? Okay. Let's start Which there. I think is a valid question. I know. I'm in, uh, do, you get, do you guys know Thicky? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm in Thicky's Telegram uh, thing with the Grand Exchange. And it's been, uh, it's been incredible just watching him just. <laughs> oh, you, be, well, hold only, on. You, you guys make fun of me. Like, I, I, he's in a, he's long and short, like every like six minutes. Well, he's all, a like, trader too, over. right? Like, you've been, you've been uh, accused of being a, like a, trout for flopping flip-flopping so much Ooh, he's the best one. he's the best the trout. Flopper. but I like mean, he, any trader can flip-flop right he, yeah. he legitimately thinks the cycle is over what yeah which i think there's like a case for like if if, if it was over we would look back and go like oh there were signals there were I mean, there were signs but yeah. the you know the oh, first I question i ask myself when someone says is the cycle over i look to the stock market i don't know why but it's my gut decision and i see the s p 500 we're on one of the best rallies since October 2023. We I think top ten rallies in like a six can you month call period. this a, a bull cycle if only one? I mean, only Bitcoin has beat its previous all time highs, and it barely just did. It doesn't even count. <laughs> can we, can doesn't we, even count. Can level. we can we pause on the cycle thing? Because like this is like a pet peeve of mine. People are like, oh, we're we're so far along, but but define our, it. Our, fine. Our, no, our sample size is two. Okay. Like we've had two cycles. Like like the idea that. Yes, I know there were one, but like, they, they weren't like real. Like, they, there's been like two, like I think, like really legitimate cycles. So like everybody who's like, oh, we have to do this. It's gonna be four years. Like all of that is nonsense. Like we can do anything that we want to. Like the price isn't beholden to like the number of months that it's gone on. I think the or, thing like, that is more where the happening is, is cycles like, and the happening and those things so much more than like this non pattern narrative of like before it was like super cycle talk in the last cycle if you don't even want to call it a cycle fine but it's like people were making stuff up like why should we go to not having structure let's utilize the structure that we do have why is two cycles not enough you to, should, you should to give us some there's, foundation there's no structure like this whole thing is still like very much like a gigantic like pvp game with the exception of like if you're maybe just like buying and holding like bitcoin and maybe like ethereum or Solana or something, but like, unless you're just diamond handing for like a long time, like most of this space is like a gigantic PVP game. It's just like a gigantic psyop where like people are trying to make you think things, 
to like buy things low and then like dump their bags on you and like anything that you kind of like hold fast to is like oh i can anchor myself to this like remember like the 200 week moving average with bitcoin it's a meme it's all memes like but these by things. the way if you would have just started dcaing anytime it went below the 200 week you'd probably been pretty happy with your results in the bear a market. lot of people were like oh yeah like this it can't go below here and then it ripped like oh it obviously it goes below, below yeah. it or something like yeah. it was it was pretty nasty right um I think every cycle is different. Every cycle has like new games and like every like everything is obviously like adapting already. Like for example, there there's two things I think that are really interesting to look at. One is obviously like the emergence of meme coins and the fact that a lot of the rotation stuff hasn't really happened. Like people just were like, "Oh, it's a bull cycle." And they just went straight risk on and then they went straight into just like the full risk stuff right like they didn't go like oh we're gonna be bitcoin and then we're gonna go to ethereum and then we're gonna go to the mid caps and like it was just full of memes right the other interesting dynamic this cycle that's kind of been playing out is that the like the meta around like the the, the altcoins and like the the distributions of them has like super super changed right so i think the market is more aware of like the fdv meme they're more aware of like just like the, like y you play these games over and over again and they kind of get fast played like you saw this with like the DeFi farms or something that worked really well for two months last cycle. And then by the end of the cycle, like you were in a farm for like 40 minutes and then it was just over. Like you just had to, cause yeah, everybody knew like the jig was up. Um, so like we have this dynamic now where like there's so many airdrops and there's so many of these coins with these massive unlocks. Like I, I saw that we were dumping like 20 or $30 billion of like tokens, like into the altcoin supply just via like kind of like airdrops and new new token distributions like this 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 quarter like this stuff has like meaningful impact and it 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 super changes everything so i think there's a lot to to think about and i i, I try not to like anchor to like a, oh this is the way it has to be because like that's a good way to kind of get wrecked i think like if you have like false hope well i like to i like the way you framed it nick um in terms of thinking about the stock market first and like what what I'm seeing in the stock market is is like there's still plenty of room to run. I think you know like um, one issue we have is that like all of the money in stocks are flowing to the Mag Seven, so there's no <laughs> breadth in this rally. But I also feel like we have like massive productivity gains and earnings can can continue rising for all these companies. And maybe we see maybe we see breadth you know catch up. Yeah. Um, and if that if that happens, and then I think there's still plenty of runway in crypto I, I still think there is yeah i mean like i think you have to have a, a little bit of a backdrop like is is liquidity going up do people feel good do they feel like they can use that extra cash they have to take go further out in the risk curve and i think you're seeing in stocks like we see like robin hood going up or stocks like robin hood kind of taking a, a getting a bid which um i don't know means there's a little more speculation in the market and bitcoin's a certain uh i think signal of that I, I feel the most faith in in the future, there still will be more Bitcoin ETF flows. We're, we're 12 billion net inflows in so far. Uh, those 12 billion have moved the stock, the you know Bitcoin price, call it 60%-ish. And I don't think it's like fully transpired, like all the plumbing hooks have, have come into play. So I, I have my bet on that we're still gonna continue up only. It's gonna be incredibly volatile. I don't think that like TradFi coming in is going to like dampen volatility. I think it could certainly, uh, you know, in enhance the the volatility. And uh, I think those inflows. How so? I mean, look at, <laughs> I don't know, look at like things like just just the Nasdaq alone. It's it's pretty volatile. Like people used to make this argument that crypto was way more volatile than the stock market. But look at like 2022, 2023. I mean, there were stocks and just indexes just ripping up and down i mean eric makes good money off of that volatility by i want to tell you ball. i want to tell you that in I, I trade options in both and on stocks the implied volatility is way higher than it is on eth wow way higher certain stocks certain stuff i'm not yeah. trading nasdaq options but like <clears throat> i'm trading individual stock options but the names that i'm trading are like double the eth implied vol yeah so i think that's a good myth buster to crypto and, volatility and like i'm not even so talking much. about like shit stock i'm talking like coinbase you know like right I, I kind of disagree with that take, though. Like, I, I don't see any universe where, like, TradFi coming in and, like, the, all these... I, I don't see 
that like increasing the bitcoin vol i mean yeah, options I, aren't enabled yet i, I think by that, default looked at it the other way but, but how about yeah. the, like I, I agree with steven's point that like it's pvp in crypto now oh but, i think that's a meme too by but, the way but the pv i don't think it's pvp no it totally is but the the pve like you can just you can like make your life a lot easier and just focus on the pve version which is like bitcoin and then like soon eth <clears throat> where the flows will be coming in in your favor and it's kind of a no-brainer what eth Bitcoin and oh, then Bitcoin. and then ETH soon TM. Yeah, I, I mean, I want to say like I I don't think the cycle's over. I just like think you have to think that it might be because it it definitely could be and it would be there there would be signs right. But like I don't I don't think it's over. Like I I personally trade I trade price action when I look at price action. You know when I look at things like momentum when I look at like your weekly closes, monthly closes, quarterly closes. Like if you look at those like kind of high time frame candles on like Bitcoin, especially like all of those are very bullish in my opinion, especially like the monthly and the quarterly close. Like I'm like, especially interested in the quarterly close. Cause if I look at like a very strong quarter, I expect the next quarter to, to be strong. And, and I want to position for a, a strong quarter. And, and the reason why I'm like kind of unbothered right now with the, the dumping that's going on is that like, if you're bullish for like a, a quarter or a week or a month, right? you anticipate after the week or the month or the quarter opens for price to go down, right? Like if you look at a candle, you've got wicks at the top and the bottom. Like if you're bullish on a candle, you want to position in the, the bottom wick. Well, that, that means price has to go down and better for it to go down like right in the beginning and position. Because if, you, if you're correct on where the candle's going, where the quarter's going, and you position in the wick, well, then you're going to have a very good quarter. And like predicting a quarterly candle is pretty fucking good because then you've got three months of you know maybe bullishness ahead of you or, or, or two so like I, f I feel pretty good right now and like i'm looking to to allocate more after you know i get back from vacation hopefully nothing runs too much without me so how would you feel about this if i if i were to like say what inning we're in mm. and i would say <clears throat> what if i what if i said we're at the end we're like we're in the middle of the second inning Ooh, that's how Sounds I feel. a little too too early too bullish. for me. Yeah, I'd say like a fourth inning, third inning, fourth inning. I, I don't, I don't. I'm only like fifty fifty that the cycles continue as they have though. Like I, I kind of think there's a good chance you just have these like volatile like mini run ups and busts where it never quite goes super parabolic and then it dumps on you and then it never quite goes negative eighty percent and then it rips up again because there is this kind of like acknowledgement of the players of in the market of like what the game is and the game has shifted right the, the game is very much shifted to etfs and institutional flows because the market sees like what that is doing for bitcoin and it's kind of thinking okay like what's going to be the next thing like it there, but there hold are on still so but, many people that have not dabbled with crypto like there are tens of millions of people that still need to adopt tens of millions, like fucking way more, like yeah. But like I mean, in, in the immediate, in the dozens immediate. of us, <laughs> in the immediate, <laughs> not billions. No. It can't be billions. Oh, there's well, surely there's a middle ground. <laughs> there's seven billion people. It can't be billions. It's tens of millions. Call it another hundred million people at least. That like in the short term, we expect to like He's adopt about this. the next year or two. Yeah, okay. yeah. And so like I, I just don't don't see this. I I think people expect like a 10 X increase in the amount of people that have adopted crypto and enter the game and that you can just like show up and dump on. And so I think the PV th PVP thing is a bit of a meme. I don't think it's correct. There are plenty of people that are new to crypto right now that are getting screwed and learning the hard way, just like we did in our day and age when we entered crypto, like in particular Solana, if you go on Reddit right now, there's people asking how to set up a wallet, where to buy, what is deck screener? There are plenty of them. It's not fully PVP. It's just that it's not adopting at the rate that we would expect for like a full, crazy, euphoric bull cycle. So I think, Stephen, that we do have one more cycle left like that, like the last cycle, before the volatility decreases to the way that you just described it. That's my yeah. prediction, at least. I, mean, it's, I it's, still it's, think it's ahead of us. I just, I mean, I hope. There, there's been no vol in Bitcoin already, right? Like, right. what's the worst drawdown we've eaten? It's like yeah. nothing. Like people, it's, it's, 10 percent. It's, 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 10 people are having a heart attack. Like, yeah. talk to me when we go negative 35. What about right? like other asset classes, though? Like, what about like homes? Like, you think that 
that's over, like prices are going to fucking no, go like, yeah. astronomical. I mean, like, I mean, if you're in Austin right now, you're getting screwed. Like real estate's kind of interesting because it's kind of very market by market. I think stocks go but, fucking to the moon. I think real estate prices to the moon, and I think crypto follows. Yeah, all. look, I'm, I'm, look, I'm mega bullish on all risk. You know, TBD. Like I've been saying this for a while. I think they pump it into the into the election to avoid Trump getting elected and then he like wins anyway and then he's just gonna just he, like he was giving a stump speech yesterday he's like oh, we're cutting up bring back all the tax cuts and just like just raining money from the sky <laughs> remove all the regulation it's it Gensler's fired you know like I could see this we 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 had like two very painful years, like two super painful bear years, like very closely spaced together. Right? It wouldn't be crazy for me to do like a decade of like nonsense, like and it's happened before. How many how many uh, presidential NFTs will there be issued over the next four and a half years? You think Trump will get in office and just start just letting oh, he's, him rip? Oh yeah, he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna he has to do like an official like I'm in office collection. For oh sure. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Why that, not? I gotta collect them all. Why not? Um, another thing that just like makes me uh, bullish that we're gonna continue is kind of what Ar- to a little bit to what Armand is saying that there's more people to come on is is the attention, and in like previous cycles, granted there's only been a few data points, like the happening is what draws people's attention, right? And I don't think the supply and demand dynamics are what actually changes price it just garners attention because there's this meme and that once the attention comes in new people come in new money comes in and we've been blessed with the etf this year so attentions come Mm -hmm. early and i think with you know the eth etf kind of hanging the winds attention will be there for the at least the next year and i mean i don't know if you guys watch cnbc or bloomberg i kind of listen to those you know every day here and there and the amount of frequency that crypto is popping up is is increasing so i think where do you get access Attention to place. that, by the way? Like, What's that? You, the cable? Like cable TV? <laughs> <laughs> What's a television? No, I mean, really, though? Is it just uh, TV? I use it or on do you have my like a, Sirius, is it a subscription? Sirius XM app uh, on my phone. Sirius and I put, in, the, put in my AirPods before wow. I go to sleep, turn on some sweet, sweet uh, Bloomberg lullabies before I fall asleep. Wait, Armand, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, we've seen like Bitcoin have a pretty good, good run and we've seen these meme coins have a good run. Solana's had a good run. So it's like a barbell strategy. Is, um, is ETH just the s- most mid thing? Is this just mid? It's and just so It's mid, so dumb. Dude. It's the thing that none of us want to admit because everyone's a fucking smarty pants around here and everyone <laughs> in this whole community is so smart and we all, and especially like so many of us like, you know, I, I think like again, like we love we're overthinking Bankless. It. We love the community of Ethereum. It's an incredible technology. It's a wonderful protocol. Permissionless makes so many things possible. We're overthinking it. It's way overthought. It's so mid. It is like the definition of that meme, dude. It's not happening the way that people want it to happen. We might have already hit the peak of the ETH BTC ratio. Like in like that could have been it. Like. That was an incredible time. Like that was actually amazing. <laughs> I just want to say I, I am literally that guy. It's so in the, in the middle. To like think I am about a mid curve guy. I I have shaved sides just like him. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> Look, I want to believe. I still my bags support my belief. I am that. I'm 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 being mid. Like I am mid curving this. Like the majority of my bags are in Ethereum. Like. But I, the more objectively I begin to look at this, I start to realize that. The barbell does not like where's the left. Show me the left curve version of Ethereum. If it's the right curve answer, where's the left curve of it? What's the equivalent of it? The left like, curve answer to a query, uh, Ethereum is like Larry Fink by Ethereum. I mean, look, we have so much ahead of us that like if this plays out, it'll be wonderful. There's just a lot of question marks. And in the short term right now, I'm not saying that ETH does not play out to be an incredible asset and does not end up being a wonderful play but right now it feels very mid you actually said that somewhere recently as well so i'm curious your your take on that you kind of alluded to the idea of the possibility of it without like admitting that you believe it um i mean i very directly said on this podcast to start the year that eth was going to disappoint everybody in the audience um and i'm a trader and an investor like i don't really trade eth it's not it hasn't been a good thing to trade like you know from time to time like there's some good stuff but like it's still like a very easy investment yeah like i i i I don't know i I, bitcoin is easier 
No, it's not is because it? if Bitcoin go if Bitcoin go up, ETH go up more. Like that, this is like such a very simple like equation, right? Like what's really moving. If you want to be a, shifted recently. If you want to be a trillion dollar asset, right? You can't have a bunch of kitties on your chain like buying hot dog coins. It's not going to move the fucking needle, right? Like if you want to get out of the kitty pool, become a multi trillion dollar asset, you need institutional flows. You need giant fucking piles of money to come in and buy your bags, right? Yes. So all of this stuff that's happening on Seoul is very cute, very happy to take the the, the trading gains, but like Seoul does not have a pathway to become like an institutionally traded coin, like in, in the form of like an ETF anywhere in the near future. And Ethereum does. And Bitcoin just blew the doors off everything. Like everybody's making money hand over fist. You think they're like, this is good. We've made enough money. No, they're like, how do we make more money? What's the next thing? ETH. Oh, oh, and oh, by the way, like Fink is on TV showing it to you. He's putting assets on chain. Like this is going to happen. Just people in the space have like the attention span. I think both of those things are nap. true. It doesn't take anything away from Solana. Solana can also have institutional flows. Yeah, it'll have day. institutional flows like five or six years from now. Sure. That might sure. be overstating it. That, that, it, that, that would mean that there isn't another ETF approved for five or six years after Ethereum because no, the there most will, likely one, no. what is it going to be, Doge? Yes, Doge <laughs> will get an ETF before Solana. <laughs> I mean, that Bitcoin would be amazing. Cash will get an ETF before Solana. Litecoin will get an ETF before Solana. Like be amazing. Coinbase already understands this. That's why, do you know that the futures they applied for recently? Mm -hmm. It's not Solana. It's Bitcoin Cash. Right. It's Litecoin it's Doge. I think we're sleeping right? on Bitcoin Cash. And then probably the like Ripple, like probably has like a yeah. pathway before Solana, Wasn't right? Bitcoin Cash like three, four thousand in the last cycle. If you're a trader, like Litecoin and Bitcoin yeah. Cash are interesting trades. They like are we don't look at them because we're like kind of like uh, uh, we're, mid, the, we're the video investor. Yeah. We're the fucking video. Like, but like if you, I'm on layer sixty nine right now. <laughs> Maximizes. <laughs> probably good. I'm They're totally probably on good layer sixty nine. They're yeah. probably good trades. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm I'm unbothered. You know, like I don't moisturized. Yes. Okay. So how about this? Very like, moisturized. With do you like, think it's mid? Well, with, no. with I do, I don't, and I'm like so fucking allocated to this idea because it it to me is is the answer. But I'm also comfortable because of like the restaking narrative. Like I'm getting yeah. yield on this thing. Like there's like airdrops coming my way too. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not like so bothered by like meme coins running. I think like didn't BlackRock just launch uh, their Bildle, Biddle, Biddle, whatever? Like, so I know that ETH's gonna get its day in the sun. So yeah, let's. Okay. Uh, that that being said, though, like I do have to say that there are certain people in Ethereum who are trying their fucking best to like drive this thing off like a fucking cliff. God, what it's is that fucking crazy. Uh, so issuance? Talk about this the issuance? issuance? Fucking, oh my God, dude. Like in this most pivotal time we're talking about. God, like, now now is the time. Of, there's a lot of things happening. Like I, I am, I'm waiting to hear, I, I'm waiting to read Optimizers, David's, dude. I'm waiting to read David's Optimizers. like why fragmentation is sovereignty medium, yeah, but I, I'm waiting to read it before dude, like I lose my shit. No, that I'm is, sure he has a good idea. No, it's killing me. When I heard, when I saw that tweet, I was like, Jesus Christ, Christ. And yeah. then, like this whole like changing the issue, like what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. It's just like stop it, read the room, or it. read the room, read the goddamn room. Yeah. <laughs> like and and like the, like I've you know you know I've I've always hated the ultrasound money thing. Like e e we're you being, know what I, even we're being investigated. Be Let's change everything, dude. I hate <sighs> the fucking internet bond thing too. I hate yes, that. like ETH isn't mid curve, but a lot of like the. The marketing around ETH like is like just, just pick a fucking lane. Like people don't understand anything. It's you the definition like of it. Bond, ultrasound money. But that's the definition of looking for product market fit and trying to create narratives and marketing to to back up like how this is going to be this like incredible play. That is the the slam dunk that the Bitcoin community has on Ethereum is like you guys don't know what you are and you keep on pushing narratives it's about the ultrasound slam dunk money. Everybody has on Ethereum because yeah. Ethereum, like if you go into business, right? One of the first things they tell you is like, don't pick market it. to everybody. Pick Just it. Just pick one fucking thing and, and do, do it, it really well. Extremely, extremely And then Ethereum's well. like, dude, I could do everything. No, like, literally. No, you can't. It's you can't exactly do everything. That. They can't do everything. Or maybe you can in the future. But even if you can do that, don't tell everybody you can do everything. Right. Don't like open up your flank on every single front to be attacked. Exactly. I confuse the shit no, on everybody who's trying to buy the coin. Can we just say that's the perfect analogy for this is the business use case analogy. If you're starting a startup, you find a thin 
edge of one wedge, you find one ideal customer profile and you target the fuck out of that and you serve them to the 10th degree in the best way that you possibly can. And then when you've filled up the well and you've squeezed the orange, then do you move to the next thing that is most in demand by that customer and the auxiliary customers that are most similar to that customer. You don't come up with it yourself. You allow the, and then and I can hear, well, Armand, like that's the whole sort of nature of the permissionless of this is it is already organically occurring. And I get that argument too. Don't get me wrong. I get that a lot of the solutions that are out in the market are because of the permissionless nature and there is demand for those things. But if I'm going to back up Steven, which I do want to do right now, it's the Ethereum community and developer community in particular has to get behind one specific narrative to push. It's okay if other people are pushing a narrative, but you can't go and, and, and do this like issuance thing at this time. That, that doesn't make sense right now. Again, we might be missing something. There might be something. No, there is nothing I could be missing. There is no <laughs> issuance plan. It could be so fucking good. It could be the best thing <laughs> since sliced bread. Like it could change it, and I, I still would hate it. I would fucking hate it. There. Okay. We need the fucking ETF. <laughs> no, it's because not the ETF. Like, okay, just, Ethereum's path. There's a spectrum. It is the most viable institutional programmable settlement layer. Steven. That is the thing. You can't go fuck it up by being like, hey, we're, is this thing a security? You're like, no, it's not a security. And everybody's like, hey, what if we change the whole fucking curve? Just because, like, stop it. Uh, it doesn't matter. I don't care what the, do it later. <laughs> God. Your testosterone is getting too this high. Is, the chat, the chat the has noticed that Steven has high testosterone rant. energy. I'm like holding this in. Let's, this is an all-time great rant. Drive me nuts. And hey, uh, Tunsky just tipped $20. Hey, we, said, ooh, we agree. Tunsky mm -hmm. said, cheers, Tunsky. fam. Happy for you that you're all back together for a pod. This is all just so pure. Oh, man. Oh, love you, Love Tunsky. you, Tunsky. Thank you so much. Um, if you, anyone man. else wants to get involved, you can go to streamlabs.com slash alfalfapod. Uh, any tip over $9, I believe, uh, your comment goes on the screen. So have some fun with the live stream if yes. you like. Let's get some of the chat goes back perspectives the pod, in baby. here because... Um, yeah, Adam said we're just... We're just <coughs> We're not trying to change it. We're just having a conversation. Stop. No. Don't have the conversation. You don't always have to say what's on your mind. Everybody knows this. I can see Gensel. I like, know you've been to a party. I told you. You want to say something. Look, it's and you're the, like, it's I shouldn't the, say something it's here. It's the spectrum. It's the spectrum that, okay, like Ethereum people shit on Bitcoin because it didn't do anything for so long. And then Ethereum just does too much. Too much. The the like, Ethereum Foundation should have this as an internal convo before yes. they take it public. Because right now, to take it public now is so short-sighted it's dangerous it, i mean i mean they're it's actually dangerous. thinking about the long term but it's like they're not thinking about the near term which is also important well uh jack lenady in the chat uh says bro nobody outside of crypto even knows what eth is wait until the etf yield deflationary what the fuck nobody even can comprehend that shit so i agree that nobody knows even the basics like the core use case of ethereum yet and when it gets some attention it'll be glorious um Let's see what else we got. Uh, someone says high testosterone energy. <laughs> Tunsky says let it out, Stephen. And Max says did Armand match his cup to the chair on purpose? Nice touch. Ooh, no, this was uh, <laughs> Stephen's doing. And we, Getting the chat cup. says this is easily the best, Stephen. So we're, we'll clip it. We'll make a meme. <laughs> exactly. Out of it. Exactly. Going, let the testosterone rip, baby. High hey, pitch. Watching clips voice. Of me where I'm like freaking out. Like, voice uh, go like, up. My yeah. face looks voice so go weird. up. Testosterone, testosterone up. up. Voice oh. pitch high. Pod better. <laughs> Pod better. <laughs> that's I know simple. I'm about to hear like a ripping argument as soon as the pitch. <laughs> hey, just, can oh. I just have a moment with our Twitter X watchers right now? I want to figure out what's going on here. Why? What do you so, see? So we got a hundred and excuse me, 201, 202 people watching live right now, according to, to Twitter. So I would like to say Hello. <laughs> hello. Hello, if Elon you are bots. not yeah. a bot, I have large. I don't bots. know if Elon is trolling me right now. Do we really have two hundred and two people on our first time ever? He just wants you to feel good. Streaming there. Like are you trying to make first me feel stream, good? The bots. Please let me know where you're watching from. Hello, welcome. Like, let's figure this out. Welcome let them to the know party. how big your quads and are. If you are just <laughs> yeah. a bot, just let me know you're a bot. You guys are welcome too. I'm like, a bot. Let's let's talk about it. <laughs> Stephen is a bot. So, but he's a you. high test bot. Plot test. <laughs> I will say to the Twitter people as well, especially if you're you know real community member out there, or even if you're first time enjoying this, please retweet the episode. This is huge for us to be able to reach new people on on X. We've never done this before, so 
hit the retweet button, share this, get it out there and um, join us every Wednesday. Yeah. And if you're watching uh, live on YouTube, give the video a like it really helps it get out there. It's been working. So appreciate all the love. Share so it on your Facebook so that the yeah. sisters come and hit on. Uh, yeah, we do more sisters. On, in chat. On let's get some more sisters. In here. <laughs> all right. So uh, let's transition. Let's actually get a tweet up on the screen. If we could, Jimmy, um, let's throw the Bernie Sander. Or let's see. Yeah. The, the Bernie Sanders tweet, not the not the video. And we'll start transitioning. Keep scrolling down, all the way down. You have to read it in the Bernie Sanders We're going voice, to life? Though. Keep going down. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, it's just the wrong spot. Not okay. the video. The one right below that one. There we go. Let's okay. pull that guy, guy up. Okay, so I'm going to read this one out loud. So Bernie Sanders tweets, workers are more than 400% more productive than they were in the 40s. And yet, almost all the economic gains from technological achievements go straight to the top. Working people must benefit from increased productivity, not just billionaires. So he has a another video where he goes on to talk and argue for the 32-hour work week. And uh, you were intrigued by this, Stephen. And I want to know what... I mostly wanted to see uh, hear Nick's take on this as a notorious... Wait a second. Notorious, Aren't you like 100% more productive automatically just having a car and getting to work? Like From the 40s? <laughs> like from the 40s? Yeah, there's like, a lot of things. Like, what, <laughs> computer. What, 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 what is the, <laughs> little, the jump here? Little, little statistical I gotta, hocus I got to be honest. On. Like, I expected a lot more than 400%. Yeah, just with a computer alone. Right. <laughs> just with some tools... Uh, a, a, a phone but steven a steven's point is well taken nick is a slave driver so i was, I was <laughs> trying not to say that but you did know did you see my tweet no the, was it? the the thing about no emails after work hours oh my california god california law no california is another state california bro california is the end also of silicon valley if that going happens. to outlaw tweets after hours if they're not emergencies huh wait what that's what the that's what the oh for work yeah Work emails. Work emails tweets, are outlawed. Emails. Oh, did I say tweets? Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's yeah. what we're, I'm talking about. That. Wait, okay. you're talking about emails oh. or tweets? Are you talking emails. about the same thing? Okay, okay. got it. Yes, right. that's the thing. Work emails, no emails. Are, are forbidden. Yeah. No, if this, it's a fugazi, but if it were to happen, that would be hilarious. That's the end of all innovation Don't of America. Don't they have that in France? That's why they're France. Well, Europe doesn't work at all. <laughs> Europe has they, never worked a day in their lives. They, they never work. They don't innovate. Yeah, like, they drink olive oil. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they, they should three be hours. Pod more from France. They, they're the innovators of the three-hour lunch break. Don't get me wrong. Love myself some balance. Would love to live in Europe. But you if just you're talking your first about innovation, lunch break in like eighteen I months, I saw I it today. It was so nice. Are naps mandatory? Nick I, Are naps Nick, mandatory? Nick and I, <laughs> Nick and I had a fifteen-minute lunch break today. We actually like sat down separate from our desks. Ever. 15. 15. Wow. We sat. We, first of Damn. all, we ate. We never eat. So yeah. much lost And we sat. Had a conversation. We had a conversation. <laughs> Not about work. We didn't look at our phones. No, we didn't. We t we just ate. It was lovely. It was so That lovely. sounds wonderful, guys. But that's a level that we're pushing here, baby. Are we are we slave driving ourselves? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, for oh, we're like, enjoy life. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, can we talk about the Zoom yesterday with Eric with his shirt off in the backyard? <laughs> and at 7 p.m. and I'm still in the office. Okay, so you know, if anyone hasn't well, turning into out a already, vampire. <laughs> Armand and I are the entrepreneurs. Jesus. Steven God. and Eric are the investors. You guys are just so, taking me on a journey here, huh? So, <laughs> so all right. All right, I'm here for it. Where are we going with this? <laughs> We have calendars, <laughs> yeah. right? And we, we like obey the yeah, calendar. Yeah, we're taking you, Stephen, as being 45 minutes late to a meeting. If, if my calendar says yeah. jump off a cliff, I'll probably get close to the edge. But like, wait a second, this isn't right. Uh, so It's like Steve Carell with his GPS. Yeah. <laughs> Into the lake? Why? <laughs> we're, and the investors we're, of the group. We're, we're, we're in the Zoom for our regular content planning meeting. It's 4.01 p, uh, p.m., mm -hmm. wondering where everyone else is. And these two guys... And you know, yeah. traders, this guys gardening, investors don't gardening, have calendars. Shirt off, shows up 420. This guy got his fell shirt through off a in the backyard. Hole. Yeah, what wormhole did you fall through? Okay, to be fair, like I'm never late, but I, I, I had a, I was on, I was in a, <laughs> I don't know, not keep that going, late. Keep going, keep going. I'm gonna do I am the lifeblood of the content I am meeting. Don't never. You dare. Don't you dare. <laughs> you could say I'm never that late. <laughs> yeah. That late. And we might not I've have never been this. that late. Okay. okay. Never That's been that late. That's a completely different statement than I'm never late. <laughs> never been that late. This is two fundamentally different Ooh. statements. I don't have to deal with this shit from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm late. I'm intentionally late. <laughs> That's a difference. Oh wow! Yeah, Much better. yeah. Okay. I was. I had a. I had a large Bitcoin trade on. That's My head was, was not. Okay. With me. Your wormhole accepted. But okay. Uh, I was just gardening. You were pre-forgiven. <laughs> Don't worry about it. 
But we're just pointing out the differences between us. Yeah, I had some weeds in the backyard. <laughs> I apologize. Were you actually gardening? Yeah, Marcus closed. Guys, guys, free. Marcus closed at one. We have a meeting at four. I was in the backyard. Wow. I was de weeding or wow. weeding, I guess is what you'd say. Dude, my life goals right there. I know. Like, that's it. I had to go go near the window of my office to get some sun because <laughs> Eric just made me so jealous. I was like, does this count if oh, yeah. I stare into the sun? I was topless. From the window? I was topless, oh, of course. Do we have any comments on this? Yeah, we do. Okay. <laughs> We do. What do you so got? I, I don't understand his argument. His argument is that like uh, p- workers should work thirty-two hours a week and still get paid the same amount. No, it's it, it's actually an interesting argument. the The argument is basically that like technology over time has increased everybody's productivity, mm-hmm. right? And like in a like if you were to like imagine utopian society, right? And like you you were working in the fields and everything, and then like God came down and handed you like crazy technology every ten years. And like increase your productivity and you were like what does your life look like a hundred years from now you might be like oh well instead of working in the field like 14 hours a day like i work like one or two hours a day and like the technology lets me spend more time with my family and everything and like all the the productivity has like enabled everybody in society to enjoy their life more right yeah but that's not what's happened obviously like people work more now i think in, in some instances yeah ha- they have to they have to why because i was promised 10% annual gains in the S&P 500 and Bernie <laughs> Sanders needs GDP to go up roughly 3% a year in order for the government to take a 20% rake and to fund his precious government programs. And I don't think he would be so happy if GDP started declining because we told to accept those technology gains and then But GDP just doesn't have to even... decline if productivity is increasing as much as they're no, saying it is. You, you, you need both. Can you can you, you need... agree to my like utopian vision at first? Do you, do you think in a, like an ideal society when technology increases productivity that like do you think in a, in a in a better world that allows the people who work to just like hey, have more this time is it right here there's like four idiots doing a podcast for fun and that, that that's it we're, we're so productive we have the creative ability to to do things like this and i i think this is like a but we're is, not this, normal this is, somebody some poor sap is like sitting in traffic like for the, like an hour and a half on their way home from work right now just like, i mean that's going to be the topic of our next discussion but i actually have a point on this so uh, in my industry, our industry, um, there's a hedge fund manager, Steve Cohen. Okay. Steve Cohen, I think, is uh, the- Big insider trading guy. Yeah. They, oh, loves insider trading. He's the, <laughs> he's the, the best. Isn't he the character? They base the character allegedly. of billions. He's built Wait, on, uh, is it allegedly yeah, or is he con- he's confirmed insider trading, right? Oh, yeah. He got, he got convicted. Okay. So, yeah. He's, anyway, he's back. He's back. He's baby. the owner of the New York Mets. He's like a prolific uh, investor. So there's and, a lesson in there, I think. And what he said, what he said <laughs> about the four day work week is that it's uh, inevitable, and he's investing accordingly. So he has bought investments um, in leisure activities, golf, travel, etc. That's know, just what billionaires invest in. But I actually think that it's it's like pointed. You know, like what what he sees is like people moving towards like an experience <laughs> economy where you have now Fridays off to do whatever you like. And uh, yeah, I mean, Europe has tested this. I think it was uh, Iceland or Norway. I think it was actually random, but Iceland did the, did the test on the four day work week most recently and they showed increased productivity. So like everyone four has day tested work week. The four day work, which is the same idea. Oh, yeah. But it, they're Sorry. working 10 hours a day? No. Hmm, I don't like uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> they have done that experiment too, though. Okay. I like that. And I, I would actually, I have considered pulling that in when we expand and start hiring people and to do like a, a one right. or two here's, time here's the a week, problem is that the, uh, Friday off. These are often What's looked... you, capitalist like, pig? You, you often, <laughs> Mr. Burns. <laughs> you often look like, wow, you, you think about the general economy, right? And then you're like, yeah, businesses should give them off. And what do you picture in your mind? Like, I think the, the biggest thought that comes to most people's minds is very large companies, thousands, tens of thousands of employees. In that situation, yeah, it might work. It might be a rounding error in terms of like how much earnings per share growth you have. But that's not the real economy. The real economy is mom and pop businesses, small to medium sized companies, companies like ours who are under, you know, five hundred million dollars in revenue that are that are trying to grow and trying to make it. Dude, and, that's that's exactly so th- you, that's exactly the point. You can't Bills survive like that, like that. End startup innovation. 
Yeah, and, and imagine there's four companies in the economy. You cannot beat incumbents in your space working 32 hours a week and your employees being like, okay, I'm done because it's 5.30 p.m. I agree. And like, I'm done. Just imagine. What do you mean? We have to beat that guy Hold on, or that like, girl or whatever. We have to beat them. It requires triple the output and innovation in order to beat the incumbent in the space. That's I agree. just basic. Basic, I agree with that, but like, can like competition can that exist even with a baseline that's lower? Like, as long as people want to like strive for the big leagues, like, and like they want to go to like the the winners that that want to work harder. I think we're talking about a specific slice called startups, and within that, no. But even no. not startups, it, it I'm talking cannot. about your if you look your brand that, new restaurant. Yeah. What you're gonna you're gonna close the restaurant on Fridays? Well, you can just hire more well, employees paying the same wage, and like your labor your labor cost remains the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know that. I do believe in constraints. And I do think that people are more productive with less time. Most people, like if we dig into a different part of the conversation, most people waste the eight hours. They're productive for one hour a day. I mean, I, I tend to agree with you that constraints are good. Like the what I love to do when I have a meeting at 1 p.m., I try to figure out what's the task because I have a real deadline and can I get it done? And so that's more of like a personal productivity thing I, I don't know if like putting constraints on the whole company right is actually going to produce more that's different you know I, and, and i think it like creates this this culture value which but i'm you wondering don't necessarily want to instill in a company here's what i'm wondering for you like for you two in particular as like entrepreneurs who run a business with employees like are you comfortable or able to hold your employees to a higher threshold than just the bare minimum because i feel like a lot of employees out there want to do more like a lot of them want to strive and win yeah imagine someone who's like in the start of their career and like wants to learn more wants to do more what are you gonna say no don't work on fridays because you're gonna make everyone else feel bad right and and that that can be okay for the average company or whatever like you can do your 32 hours but for you guys you're like no we demand more because we're we're going to be the best and that attracts the best and that's okay yeah yeah yeah, so I don't know. I, you play this game theory out, and it's it's like imagine the economy's four companies, each on one corner of the street, and as soon as someone breaks, you know, breaks the game theory and is like, no, we're going to work, uh, you know, twenty percent more and be more productive, it, it doesn't it doesn't really work out. I mean, you see this though, like you see this in uh, investment banking, like at Goldman Sachs, these guys work, you know, hundred hour plus weeks you know, as an entry level investment banker and they, they earn less than, than a McDonald's employee on an hourly basis. I, I disagree with that. Well, I mean, this is like the, that's yeah. like the urban legend or whatever. Yeah. I mean, like, listen, the reason they work is because the commission rip on closing an investment banking deal is fucking massive. And that's how you make your nut in the year. Like talk to most salespeople like, oh, you want to take 20% yeah, of your their time base off? Salary will definitely like, be How are you going to close deals? Like, I mean, it's just like on lawyers who work on billable hours. Yeah. 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 Please accept 20% less pay. And I, I don't, just don't think it's reasonable, practical, like most things out of uh, old man Bernie's mouth. Yeah. It's just. Um, it feels good. Sound it, goody. It feels do good. goody. It's, okay, so nice. it's okay. do goody <sighs> stuff that hurts the thing that makes America special at the end of the day. It's stuff that I used to love and support when I heard. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, baby, that sounds good. Can I give good. another angle to this? Put the people first. And when you remove your emotions from the equation, you start to realize how it actually has a counterintuitive <clears throat> impact on everything that you're seeking to create. Let the companies that want to create that create that. Exactly. Let the companies that want to work harder work harder and let the people decide where they want to work. Don't need the government to institute these culture values within my organization. Exactly, because top down isn't doesn't really work on a massive. There's scale. a company like, that does that. Go find that company and go work. And for if them. that company wants to use that as a recruiting tool to hire smarter, exactly. you know, more impressive talent, then let them do that. And if it works in the market, people will follow suit. Right. I will be forced to follow suit. Right. No question. It's, all, it's like the same exact logic that I just used. But you're just saying the other side of it, I think. Yeah. You, like, yeah. I mean, I just said the same <sighs> thing, right? Like, sorry, do we do we disagree with you just to disagree? No, I no, actually there was no disagreement. No, I actually think that I was giving the <clears throat> counter argument, but using the same logic. Mm -hmm. Like the counter argument was, that's okay. Now the baseline is lowered, but for your companies, we'll you still can go harder. You can go harder, and that yeah. will attract. I'd the rather people not. Work. You'd rather have the baseline be higher, and yeah. you can still go harder. No baseline. There's just 
let it be. Well, the baseline is that there's a 40 hour work week, and that's like a cultural baseline. Yeah, why is the base? Yeah. Why is why do we have a 40 hour work week? That, why why that isn't is, it, why isn't that, it 60? The statement is why correct. isn't it 80? The statement right. is correct. So it's like a cultural that we agreement. 40 hours. Is that not just like arbitrary? So what do you think? Do you think that we need to evolve it because times have changed? I think a lot of what he's saying is true on like a deep level. I also think it's like very oversimplified. Like right. there's like a lot of nuance here. Like there are certain jobs. Like if you're in a startup and you're killing yourself working like 100 hours a week, you're not you're not working because you're making an hourly. You're working because you're like building equity, right? Like if you're in an early startup employee you probably have equity in the company you're working towards this like more grandiose vision it's not true like if you work at mcdonald's as like a cashier right like right. sure i guess you can move up there to be, is like, a, a manager, lot of but you're never gonna have like a thousand x we're conflating a lot of so hold on here. so jimmy just pulled this <laughs> up jimmy this out. jimmy doesn't have a mic today but uh he pulled up a, an article saying that henry ford popularized the 40-hour work week um saying that you know this idea has some lindy like he popularized it because he noticed that working people harder than 40 hours uh, had like very yeah, no, meaningless th this results. This is my point exactly. Like the, the reason why productivity keeps increasing and people keep working the same amount is because like the way the system is optimized via capitalism. God, I sound like a... <laughs> but like the way the system is optimized on, is comrade. to basically <laughs> push like humans to basically like their physiological and psychological breaking point. And that is why you work that many hours not because like that yields the most profit so it's like that's as much as like you can be pushed yeah like it's we before found, you break we found that 40 and is like, the goal as long as you physically don't break at 40 hours like productivity can increase a thousand percent two thousand percent five thousand percent it won't matter you'll still keep working 40 hours because the system is optimized to your breaking point not to like have everything sort of like so Look, I'm I'm a capitalist at heart, but like I understand like some of the sentiment behind these arguments, and I think this kind of feeds into a lot of what like Yang has been pushing with like the UBI and stuff, because there is this like element of truth to it. Like it, it, as technical as technology like keeps increasing and increasing and increasing, productivity of every human is going to go up and up and up and up and up. Fact, and it's not going to manifest in people like working less. Like they're going to keep working the same amount and like those gains but are going to keep what about in the, in the fastest growing parts of the economy where like you need more workers in, in that part of the economy that we don't currently have like you want those parts of the economy to be able to grow but like let's say you implement these things it, it's just going to be tough for those for those companies to really attract that that type of labor i just i just don't <laughs> think it works like imagine like if airlines are short pilots and then all of a sudden, Bernie comes down, partners with the labor unions, and they get across a 32-hour work week. Like you're gonna, you're gonna hamper that part of the economy in which you you want it, you want it to grow. So, yeah, I, I, I'm on your side. Like I'm okay. against like government mandated. Like you can't work this and that. Like I, I, I want things to happen via like a collective like conscious, consciousness you want the market shift to play out. Yeah, which is hard sometimes but like if everybody just realized this collectively and was just like no then the market would change and companies who offer different things would be rewarded disproportionately and yeah so let's let's get the chat involved uh hookham says nick's employees just called when 32 hour work week <laughs> um <laughs> never gonna happen let's see buddy. tom nom nom says startups already work seven days a week does this actually change anything for startup cultures edmund says 32 hours in two days, right? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, what else we got? Uh, Hookham also points out they actually start losing employees when they can't work overtime because um, that's part key part of their That's their compensation. Earnings. Yeah. yeah. Um, Edmund also says, ain't nobody got time for that shit. So let's, uh, let's continue on on kind of like the, the work theme. I wanted to, um, I saw this article in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Jimmy, if you could, you could pull it up. And I thought it's kind of... Uh, an evidence of some of the themes we've been talking about. Um, it's an article about how Gen Z is becoming the tool belt generation. Essentially, Gen Z is getting into mm. trade. So I'm just going to read the first mm. uh, paragraph of the article because I think it kind of sums it up correctly. Uh, America needs more plumbers, and Gen Z is answering the call. Long beset a labor crunch. The skilled trades are newly appealing to the youngest cohort of American workers, many of whom are choosing to leave the college path. Rising pay and new technologies and fields from welding to machine tooling 
are giving trade professions a facelift, helping them shed the image of being dirty, low in work, growing skepticism about the return on a college education, the cost of which has soared in recent decades is adding to their shine. It goes on to talk about how enrollment in vocation training programs is increasing uh, in the last five years. And specifically in the last five years, these have become extremely popular. And so I kind of want to hear your guys' thoughts on this because I, I find this fascinating shift in the economy. And I have nephews who are, you know, kind of just out of that high school range and they haven't asked me for advice, but if I was going to give them advice, I, I wonder if that is the advice I, I would give them rather than, you know, rack up some debt and, and go into college. And I feel like at this point I can make a pretty good argument for if it was my son or daughter being like, Hey dad, I'm about to graduate college in a year and a half. What do you think I should do? I want to be financially secure at the very least in my life and hopefully be financially abundant. But like, w what should I do with my life? And I find that advice starkly changing from just what it was like five to seven years ago. So in that article, Nick, did they um, give any data on like the amount of jobs that will need to be filled uh, <clears throat> by Gen Z? Because like, I think what I what I see just like as a heuristic basis is like, we don't have enough people from our age group that are like filling those roles because we were all taught to be a knowledge worker, not like work with your hands right. person. Well, they, they talked about the, the crazy surge of demand for these trades workers. And it, and it comes from a few areas. Like the main one is that baby boomers are retiring. And you can see on Twitter, on, on you know, finance Twitter, I guess you could call it. These PE firms are just hot and bothered over any baby boomer about to sell their company because it's a fencing company, it's an H HVAC company, a pool cleaning company, and they are rolling up all these companies into larger things and then selling off for a higher, higher PE. But that is the reason that we need these jobs. So the baby boomers are rolling off. They were the ones who took on these trades. They're getting to the point where like they're ready to retire. They're happy to sell off their business. And so that creates an opportunity where we need these jobs. Yeah, but the problem is the, the, the Zoomers want to be influencers and YouTubers, and we need them to become plumbers and electricians. Okay, I think that's a, that's a distribution thing. So like on one mm -hmm. end, you see the top job that Gen Z want to be is like a YouTube influencer. Yep. But I, I think if you looked at the middle of the curve, the, the thick 80% of the curve, they they just want to buy a house and like be financially free. And there's a good argument that Gen Zers can be at that point by age 22, while the other guy is still in college, you know, trying to figure out, you know. Racking up six-figure debt. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about like the impact that AI will have on this and like the most in-demand type of work is... Blue collar is not just white collar now, it's diamond collar. Dude. Right, so that's the second part this of the demand like generation. Diamond collar, you know, work is like doing things that nobody else can do. I mean, like the argument will be that like optimist robots and things like that that will be AI powered and have spatial awareness will be able to go in the home and do the plumbing work and electricity work in the future. Sure, but for the time being, we don't know how long that's going to play out, like till it takes to play out. You yeah, have like, an opportunity to go to trade school, take no debt on, make more money than anyone else, have demand and your book like full of clients. You don't even have to do the work. You could just own the company. So like I think something a lot of people get wrong as well is like the new form of entrepreneurship doesn't have to be starting a software company. It could be starting business. an HVAC company. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's like, that's where you can make a killing. So I uh, at the beginning of the year I invest in a company called Universal Technical Institute. It's a ticker symbol UTI. They've been just like growing Wait, in demand. What? Yeah, killer UT, <laughs> killer ticker, very viral. Doesn't, ticker doesn't symbol UTI. Stop it. Um, but but you look at their their website and what they market is is essentially that. Like these jobs are going to be needed. What's more at risk, an Excel junkie and a guy who's a creative, you know, thousand pr producer? percent. It's the Excel junkie is more at risk. <laughs> Yeah, Knowledge exactly. Knowledge workers are by far, this is the thing we all got wrong about AI. When ChatGPT first came out, we did episodes on this, right? We were like, oh, so like the basic things will go first. No, no, no. It was the creative things. The knowledge workers. The knowledge. Yeah. So, dude, this <laughs> this idea or this topic is, is like near and dear to my heart. Like I saw a conversation on CNBC yesterday 
with Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe is the guy who... Uh, Dirty Jobs. Yeah, from Dirty Jobs yeah. on Discovery Channel. So he's pushing this whole agenda. I think he's been pushing it for years. Like, let's change the, the stigma around uh, trades work. Okay, because like he says, he says that we've glorified the job that's in the corner office. At the same time, we've belittled the jobs that build the corner office. And uh, he's got a scholarship called the called the Work Ethics Scholarship that I I actually just donated to uh, this morning. Hmm. Um, I'm like really touched by this thing. And uh, what what it does is it like it provides this path for for young <coughs> students who like see what we're talking about where like the four year degree might not be that compelling of a proposition anymore. So he, he started this scholarship called the work ethics scholarship. It has, it has these 12 commandments that really touched me. And I, I wrote down these notes, the 12, I'm not going to read all, all 12 of them, but I, I do have three that I particularly love mm. three commandments that, um, hit me Moses. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> Here they are. So number three is, I do not follow my passion. I bring it with me. Any job can be done with passion and enthusiasm. Ooh. Okay. Number 10 is, I believe I am a product of my choices, not my circumstances. I will never blame anyone for my shortcomings or the challenges I face. Number 12, I believe all people are created equal. All people make choices. Some choose to be lazy. Some choose to sleep in. I choose to work my butt off. It's right. very uh, conservative. Well, what I like <laughs> what I like about it, and like I don't have well, any where's children. Where's the victimhood? I don't understand. How do you gain success? I don't have like, any children, uh, but it in if there. I if I had a child, I would want them to go through this program because I feel like these skills that are being taught in the work ethic scholarship are transferable across any career, not just like a trades career. Yeah. But like I would be open to my kid becoming a, a tradesman. Absolutely, and like Mike Rowe probably did more than anyone to knock the kind of like. I don't know, low brow feel on, on tradesmen. He was ahead of his time. He was, but I don't think he had some of the best arguments because I think the best argument to really knock off the, the low brow appeal of it is that someone can make six figures within four to five years and you can get there at an earlier age because call it 15 grand in nine months and you, you'd at least get away to, to get started. So it's cheaper than a four-year college. It's, it's faster than a uh, four-year college. And I think it's a lower risk way of being able to earn as a 19 year old not a graduated college 22 23 year old so by the time most four-year colleges graduates are are trying to enter the market you know open-eyed like i where's my where's my fat salary you know these people could potentially already be making a hundred thousand dollars a year at that age and then it is kind of and they, they talk about this in the wall street journal article that the entrepreneurship angle is what's kind of alluring Gen Z that I may uh, work as a CNC technician uh, or an automotive technician, but the jump from starting, you know, working at one of those firms to, to starting one on my own it is not that big. And, and I think as a potential future father, if I had two sons and one was like, invest in my four year college degree, uh, you know, pay for my college essentially, or the other ones like, listen, pay for my 15K, uh, you know, nine month apprentice. I'll get a job. And after three years, I'm going to come to you and I would like startup funds for, you know, my fencing business or my pool repair business or my, you know, mobile detailing, wh whatever it is in that kind of category. Kind of like to like ladder investment. But what I, what I actually like about it is that like our our kids are going to have the luxury of both, right? Like we can give them any opportunity they, they desire. So what I would want is like a four year degree plus this like work ethic scholarship where the tenants are, are like built in and like, what you do know, you want it for? So maybe it's like, maybe you're not just, degree. so maybe What's it's not it an electrician just broadly, mm -hmm. but maybe you're an electrician for something like really specialized. That's like really important, like a yeah. nuclear facility or something. Right. Or maybe you're a manager at this nuclear facility of electricians. And like that becomes pretty lucrative as well. Well, it's interesting you mention that because in the article, they talk about this woman who uh, worked for a construction company building high rises. And so she thought, you know, she was going to learn project management over time, but she was going to be doing some real grunt labor. And one of the first things they did after like six months of employment was like teach her to use this robot that like scans the job site. And I don't know exactly what that robot does, but she's in charge of like manning it. And she's like, wow, I didn't really 
think I'd be doing some like really tacit critical thinking work in, in managing this high end technology, but, but here I am. And so at the same time, you might want to start a startup because you want to get into some deep tech, cool stuff. Those also exist in, in trades. And so, you know, I think they'll have both those opportunities and you're right, I guess. As long as like my kid doesn't like, I want to just instill this idea that like, um, no work is above or below you. So you don't want them like taking off around 1 p.m. to go garden and take their su- shirt off and sunbathe. No, gardening is not above you or below you. <laughs> okay. Like you can just still you can still garden with your shirt off. But like you know, like here's a funny thing. Like my neighbors, my neighbors like all asked me because we had like this uh, holiday party a couple months ago, and they were like, "Oh, so do you use Ernesto? Like, who's your gardener?" And I was like, "You're looking at him." Like. <laughs> And they, like, were, oh, they I, were I didn't shocked. know your Latino descent. <laughs> they, were they were shocked. They were shocked. Like something that I think is really important. Okay. This this idea that like what society has constructed as like meaningful work is completely made up. It's arbitrary. It's completely made up. The university system is made up. The approvals that an individual needs to receive to do to do certain work and to be appreciated by society are made up the how you ascend the hierarchy of society is completely made up the cost like the debt you have to incur it's, like it's all it's all fugazi. bullshit it's all bullshit and so anytime something has a slightly negative or positive uh sort of like brand to it i always question that i'm like why where did this come from and why does it exist? Well, the reason that like blue collar as a label exists versus white collar in general, there's there's many reasons. But one factor is that we have created this belief in this system that says those that learn how to play this specific game that measures IQ and effectiveness and trustworthiness better than others deserve these jobs, which then pay this money. So you don't want someone who hasn't earned the right to be your doctor to be your doctor. There are certain things that are necessary from a fundamental educational perspective that we need before we go into surgery to make sure that we feel comfortable that this person knows what they're doing. There's no question that those degrees exist for a reason in certain realms, but there are many types of degrees that are absolutely nonsense. Business degrees, I have one of them. How about communications? <laughs> communications degrees. Fuck off. You know, yeah, <laughs> seriously, like fuck off. From a, uh, market, from a marketer. And How about liberal arts? <laughs> and, and, and liberal <laughs> arts one. is also funny, but actually liberal arts is one of those where there's actually a lot of nuance that I'm a romantic about. And the reason for that is that I actually believe that like liberal arts is a beautiful thing because those people are learning for the sake of learning. Are They're you... there to actually just like read and digest. It's history. It's Are you literature. romantic about part of your tax paying dollars go to like subsidizing no. the loan losses no. student loan losses that's for those annoying degrees? Okay. that's <laughs> annoying but the you could go and get create your own wonderful liberal arts degree 100 percent. agreed and so there's a lot of this idea of like what society is constructed to be respectable and to that i challenge everything i say like that's just complete nonsense that's why i never will look you know i, I love what you said eric because it's like never be below or beneath something never look down or on, on anybody for anything that they do because you don't know their story. You don't know how they arrived there. You don't know why they elected to do that. Maybe that's their Mexican fisherman parable was to realize that like they could have just became a ceramic artist from day one. Why wait till they retired to start creating ceramics? Like so, it's nonsense. So I, I think we agree here, but like you guys as you know, leaders of, of businesses, I think you you would say the same thing. It's like if you saw somebody who didn't have the pedigree but came in with a work ethic that was just fucking above and beyond everybody else and was willing to learn and and like take criticism and and you know adapt to that like you would you would take that 10 times out of 10 over some guy who had like a you know MIT on paper. Yeah, the, the on paper. The, yeah. And so like I think what what spoke to me about Mike Rose scholarship was like it's instilling these traits that are like work ethic based independent of the, of the on paper. Bullshit. Yes. Yes. We don't have a truly meritocratic system. That's the one we should strive for where the way that society is constructed as a meritocracy. It's actually not, it's a lot of 
bullshit hierarchical systems that exist. Yeah, it's credentialism. credentialism. That's Ooh. a good word for it. That's like basically that what college is. Yes. It's a giant like rubber stamping system. Yeah. And again, caveat, there are certain things that need credentials. For sure. Like I, I have sure. an MBA and you know who the only people who you care? Have an MBA? Yeah, do you know the only <laughs> only people who care about that I have actually an had MBA no idea. Is yeah. I remember when he got it. It's, yeah. Wait, you have an MBA? Yeah. How do I not know this? I don't know. You know it now. He got it like soon after his bachelor's. Like he did it like er, before yeah, he I met Yeah, I took a year probably. off oh, and then oh, went you're straight so into smart it. Smart business. And uh, the only people who care about that I have an MBA is other people who have an MBA. <laughs> yeah, I care. They, they, I'll tell you what, though. <laughs> the man well, knows. Care, 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 let me they, tell you. Go let me tell you. I, I hold you in at least like 7% Let me more tell steam you what now. he got out yeah. of it. The man That's knows how to work a fucking spreadsheet. <laughs> that thing is wow. on fire. So the, I would love to actually have his so skills on a spreadsheet. So the first big leap I got in my career, I was uh, we kind of started this consulting firm. And one of our clients, uh, we were doing uh, paid user acquisition for them. And we crushed it. Like we just scaled this company so far and it was me and another consultant working on it and we were just blowing this company up. They were hiring like crazy. And finally, um, they got me and my uh, owner of the consulting company room. They were like, um, we'd like to directly hire Nick and have him come to our company and we'd like to give him the CEO position. And you would and then, not have gotten that if you had then, not had the MBA, And then we're going to move to the board of directors and we're going to start other things inside the company. And I was like... Wait, pardon? And uh, they were like, yeah, you, you know, you, you don't really know uh, software yet and, and finance, but, you know, you got an MBA, so you, you'll figure it out. You're ready, kid. And I was like, <laughs> okay, like I was totally in. But like at that point, it was helpful just because the other people across the table had an MBA and they valued it and they thought it actually was going to help me. And, you know, fast forward six months later. But I was, you, could, you could argue that that made your whole career. Maybe, maybe. Well, I mean, everything does. Every decision, every moment does. It was like right? they just plopped me into like a fifty million dollar P and I was a CEO, like, what the fuck? If you hadn't become a CEO of a company placed in that position at that young of an age, would your career have taken the trajectory no. it did today? Well, hold on, because no. I, I think that uh, there's a difference between like CEO who's like a caretaker position of a conglomerate business versus yeah. like uh, somebody who's like a practitioner who's like executing on a day-to-day -day basis and i feel like both of you guys are are that and yes. and like with that it doesn't matter what your credentials are you've got to perform like right you right. have to like but his situation was a little different that he's describing but i'm just saying in, in that point it was like, like a mini version they gave me of the way too much responsibility At because point. of the credential thing. but nowadays like nowadays you don't you're not involved in a business like that nowadays yeah. you gotta like yeah sell shit but it, yeah it's funny there's i think there's three types of entre entrepreneurs there's like a retriever a bloodhound and a great dane the retriever is the one who can like literally there's nothing exists and they can go and grab all the resources somehow and make something exist the money the people the idea and they're just so good at it and you know they can make something out of nothing and then you have the bloodhounds it's a company that already exists and but they know the scent they know the path they know the strategy they're like i can direct this 30 50 100 person company to to valhalla and I know the path to go and follow me and we'll go there. And then you got the Great Danes. It's like, hey, come uh, be in charge of like Boeing or like, I don't know, some massive company. And your job is to not fuck it up. Like make sure we grow at like X percent a year, but like just take care, manage risk, manage capital markets. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think entrepreneurs. Which kinda, one are you? I don't know. Like I, I've done the. Which one are you best at? Done no, the, which one have you done? The startup part, but I think I really excel at the bloodhound thing like you know ah, other same. business partners Armand, you're a bloodhound I, i've things. been a retriever mostly but i'm a better bloodhound i'm i'm a very good bloodhound yeah. i'm more of a shiba inu <laughs> <laughs> yeah what are these dog names we're gonna upgrade these dog names well, thank you steven <laughs> yeah, thank you for that <laughs> which one is which one is the right, whiff let's uh let's let's continue on uh is this jimmy the final is uh, this the final one i'm gonna give a short pop and then we'll go to the final okay so i want to go to quickly the final to this of what nikita beer I want, I want there to be some drama mm. around it you know it's I like, about mm. pr crises mm. um i'll let you find it and while you find it i will there it is i'll oh, read the tweet i liked this so um, I, by the way do you guys follow this guy no, no i do this is a great follow. This guy is the alpha on getting Dude, your app to like how? number one in the app store. This guy tweets well. Well, he's very. He clever. sold a company to Facebook, this and then I think he tweets. created the same tweets company, well. and that like the, the copy no of the company fucks. sold to Facebook, he and then sold no it again too. 
Um, yeah, I don't know anything about him. I just like his tweets. All right. So, uh, are you guys? Do you guys consider yourself Huber boys? Huberman, oh, I'm a Huber boy. Huberman bros. No, no, no. I no mean, but I, I have asked the Discord, like, is this guy so good that I should just accept everything he says? Because I, I don't want to put in the, the rigor to like. Yeah, it gives me very like weird god complex culty vibes. What? You yeah. guys don't want to join the cult? No. Come on. <laughs> man. Like, everything about that makes Dude, me go. Sometimes like, mm. in life, you got to just stop asking questions mm. and bathing in the gray no, and just there's, accept there's, the there's cult. There's a reason wow. my. Just accept the cult. All right, accept so, it. So Become a Huber boy. He's the number one health Uber podcaster. Man. Yo, that that Uber title on man. Google search was hilarious. It yeah. said, "Can we Andrew just talk Huberman's about what a great five name. body problem?" So the five body problem <laughs> stems from. A Wait, hold on. What is the five body problem again? <laughs> okay, like so a, there's there's a Netflix uh, a show, show called the Three Body Problem. <laughs> yeah, and he's oh, got that's a, like a physics thing. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. got a five body problem because a variety article women. came out to five girlfriends. You know, demolish oh, he had five girlfriends at one time. Okay, anyway, I don't want to really talk about that scandal because it's kind of like the worthless. most I ever had was three, so I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> you had three girlfriends? Yeah, in college. It was tough. It was in tough. college, this guy is like a uh, like yeah, a year old. First of all, no, no, no. <laughs> Wait, he's a man. When you he's say 40 your girlfriend, like you literally asked all three of them to be your girlfriend? <laughs> no, not like that. Wait, so you're just dating, dating three, girls? three girls? Dating three girls. Oh, okay. Go. They weren't five girlfriends, were they? Someone be rolling his eyes right now. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> some it's be like, not. Oh, three I'm girlfriends? Like, 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 seven cool. Is here. that? Is that not? Is that? <laughs> I was exhausted. Three, three. <laughs> I was three exhausted. Actual uh, girlfriends would be noteworthy, but like you I mean, dating were, three girls. What in college I'm saying is like, by they weren't girlfriends, just, they were girlfriends. But you know when you're in that like f boy stage where you don't ask anyone to be your girlfriend. That is baseline fuck boy. Yeah. Baseline fuck boy is you yeah. have like three girlfriends. Yeah. That's well, just well just, baseline fuck boy is you don't ever be man enough to say to somebody, will you be my girlfriend? That's the key. That's the secret. So that's what Huberman something. was doing, I, I guess. I don't know. Right? Whatever he was doing, it was five or seven, and he got um, a hit piece. He right? got smurfed. By yeah. New York Magazine. Yeah, or Variety or whatever. No, New York. New York Magazine. New York, yeah, anyway, whatever. And I don't really want to talk about that. But, no. but, but I, I do like to examine his, his response. So uh, Nikita tweets out, after working with many founders during a PR crisis, here... The advice you get for each price level, hopefully it will save you money. So he's kind of making a joke here. Uh, number one, in-house comms. Like if you have someone inside your company helping you with this crisis, cost is $0. The advice, put out an apology, announce changes, which will subsequently get picked apart by every critic. Cycle length will cause you two years or more. So your, your crisis will extend out. Then he says, okay, if you hire a mid-tier comms agency, probably cost $10,000 a month. Go silent. Don't say anything is the advice. It'll probably go away in two weeks. The S-tier. X White House crisis firm cost fifty thousand dollars a month. The advice just post through it like nothing happened. Cycle length goes away in forty eight hours, and this is That's the what route Uber that Huberman has changed. He's yeah. posting like nothing ever happened, and it's kind of died down. Maybe it's been five six days, and it's there's smart. nothing it's to it's not give anybody to even, fuel. Well, hold on, I, there's no fuel. Yeah. Can I ask a question about this? Because like, does it change for each individual? <laughs> like, because what I see in politics is like. Trump, who, who like has this character that nothing sticks to him, can play that like S tier role. But then, like, if Biden tried to play that, he would just get fucking demolished. By right. So trying to do the S tier. So three. Trump, I forget his, his like mentor's name, but he he took out of his mentor's playbook, who was literally like always forward, never apologize. Uh, that documentary not, not talks about one that. bit of apology. Do not yeah. retreat one half a step you don't back. Say. And I never mean, noticed that. Yeah, but so there's there's another tier that he didn't he didn't mention, which is like just on attack all the time, yeah. relentless. I was actually wondering why that was missing. And I think for like a presidential candidate, it works great because like you're constantly just like peaking your attention cycle. I can't believe he just said that. And the next scandal comes out. Oh my god, I can't believe he said that you too. You just burn out. Everybody's like they just can't right. pay and, attention. And anymore. by the time you've said like something that's three out of ten for your scale, they don't give a fuck anymore. And then he's like, I'll go out and I can go shoot someone on Fifth Avenue. And like people are like, oh, my God. But then most people are just kind of like blunt, yeah. blunted. To it. Oh, yeah. See, that statement, when he first said that, that was just like, oh, my God. And now it's just like, oh, that's cute. Yeah. That's that doesn't even like break the top. The 50. funny orange man yeah, said it's that. It's just like, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's so that, that must be like a level four of, of this scale. Yeah, level that's like three, 100 grand a month. Level three is you just don't do anything. Level four is you just. You have to be a special kind of person, though, to do I that. Think, I think what a lot of people learned in the last five years ish years in particular was when you especially in the cancel culture world the 
mistake was to apologize. Everybody who had the cojones learned you don't apologize. And some people still apologized because they just felt so much guilt. And that ended up causing incredible consequences for them. I know so many people like in the marketing space or influencer space or authors or this or that, you know, even like look at, look at JK Rowling, the opposite, never has apologized, doubled down, has taken a, a stronger approach. That's a very extreme example, by the way, on a very controversial topic. But the point is those that just continue to be who they are and play through it. You know, Jordan Peterson is probably another example of someone who's talked about this, who has talked about never, you know, never bend the knee, never bend the knee to these people. They that was, will a, crucify. That was a terrible Jordan Peterson. That was not impression. a Jordan Peterson. <laughs> uh, that was just a, that was Jordan, you do a good that was Jordan Peterson's. Why don't you, why don't you do a Peterson. never bend the knee? That was Jordan Peterson's alter ego. Um, <laughs> Steven, <laughs> please. Southern, Steven, that was please Southern Jordan do Peterson. Do a never bend the knee. Do a Kermit. Yeah. Do, do a Kermit. Ready. Do a Kermit. Never bend the knee. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing it. Oh, you actually have that on command. Yeah, like, that's, that's good. really good. <laughs> Can you cry too? Like, so Can dirty. you give it a? No, I, I can't. I can't cry. Dude, let's put you in a three-piece suit and just you know, once every episode, we'll pull out a Jordan Peterson. Did you see his Joker suit? He's a Joker suit. Oh yeah, he went full Wait, Joker what? in one episode. Of, forget who he got interviewed on. Look. Point I is, mean, I saw the suit where he had like never two been suits knee. stitched together. Is yeah. that a different one? Yeah, that was a Joker suit. Uh, so the that. idea behind this is that like these, mm. the woke mob is like burning embers, and you don't want to breathe any yeah, don't. oxygen into it. Don't so do like, anything. don't apologize. Don't speak to it. Just let it exhaust itself. It does. Oh, this is like the heaven and hell suit or something, right? Yeah, uh, there was a different one. That was actually you a got cool that up suit. on the on the screen. I liked Jimmy. that one. Um, yeah, this is this is the Joker suit. I mean, he that, talks about it. He he calls himself a a. Uh, a, a blood sucking, you know, filthy pig capitalist. I liked Jordan Peterson so much when he just kind of like wrote a book and didn't become like a, a political political thing. Commentary. And now I find him like mega cringe. Jordan but I think Peterson's the suit greatest is, content uh, is I think psychological cool. significance of the Bible and everything that has to do with the meaning of life. Everything else is like, why are you talking about that? Yeah, don't talk about Bitcoin, please. Yeah, leave Bitcoin alone. Um, and I love him for the record. So, uh, uh, Roy Cohn was the person I was thinking of uh, in terms of like Trump's idol. He kind of got his uh, infamy in, during the McCarthy hearings. And then Adam Snyder also mentioned Roger Stone. Uh, Edmund says, mm. Huberman knows his shit. Come on now. Um, Huberman's the GOAT. Yeah, he is. If you can't trust a scientist out of Stanford Lab like Huberman, who are you going to trust? If you can't anymore? trust a credentialed guy out of a university with a <laughs> podcast, who can you trust anymore? I mean, the whole world is just going to fall is, apart. Was the giveaway, was the tell the podcast? Is that when Look, things went down? Yeah, him? never trust anything you hear in a podcast, kids. Yeah, they were like, in, in the article, they were like, and he has sponsors. And yeah. those sponsors pay him money. And when they pay him money, he has to talk about athletic greens. <laughs> it's like They're what I like. What I like about Huberman is such that such douchebags. Fuck those people. From a guy who doesn't listen that much, what I like about him is that he seems to present the the research. It's not like I don't. It seems like he's giving less of his opinion. He's like, well, here's what this research showed. It's like dude, a lesson he, plan for dude, like when a he gets his teaching. opinion. He's very clear, like as well. He's like, I don't take this. This is the result of the study. Right. Do with it what you will. I do take this. No studies back up the reason why I take this. I subjectively have more energy when I take NMN. Yeah, how do you know? That's what he says. How do you find fault? There's in no that? study that shows taking NMN uh, take increases my NAD plus, and that's why I take it. And there's a reason to do it for longevity. He's very clear on these things. That's the kind of scientist I want to learn from personally. So anyway, uh, that's Jack, a good episode. Jack ripped that. guy with tattoos dating five women. Yeah. <laughs> Hells yeah, brother. Um, all right. So last uh, last topic in the card here I have is an Atlantic article called End the Phone-Based Childhood Now. This is the last topic? Well, it's the last topic. That's right. Oh, my God. Okay. That's Why, right. did you want to supersede? We say the best no, for last. I just want to get you know ready. That's right. Get everybody settled in. settle in. Okay. Um, I don't know, Stephen. You want to give us a little intro to this uh, to this article? It was behind a paywall, so I'll be honest. Yeah, I, so I never read, read it. <laughs> That's uh, okay. Let me uh, let me just pull up my. Uh, Can I notes kick it off? Y you have it. I just want to say something. Oh yeah, go for Can it. Can you believe that fifty percent of teenagers have anxiety and depression, 
and 141% of teenage girls 10 to 14 committed suicide. Wait, increase. What? You said 141%? 140% oh, increase. Increase. increase in ha, size. ha, ha. Somebody, somebody clip, Thank you. Somebody clip 140 that. Per- <laughs> what is it? You. No, I wasn't being okay. nitpicky. Did no, you just know? like clarify? You got us all. You got us all for a loop there. 14% of teenage Christ. girls committed wasted. suicide last year. 141%. <laughs> I'm sorry. I Can shouldn't we be, talk, I we shouldn't we're be talking about, at this. We're talking I about something serious. I'm sorry. 50% increase, not percentage. 50% increase and 141% increase in that sector of teenage girls 10 to 14 and 10 to 19 50% increase in depression and anxiety 10 to, 10 to 14 Did you see chart? 10 to 14 3x women girls rate of yes. suicide yes 2007 to 2020 yes. 2021 so are you what will you the phones it is that's the entire that's Jonathan Haidt's thesis of that's, the article. That's so his the, yeah, point. The, I mean, the TLDR of this article, if, if you want to go read it or read statistics. it, take it, he's done some good interviews on, on Rogan and a couple other things lately. Um, yeah, the TLDR is basically like the smartphone is just destroying who, the who, youths. Real quick, who is Jonathan Haidt? Is he, is he like a. He wrote the prolific author. of the American Mind, ah, okay. which is on Rogan often a few times. Big author. Cited. He was that's just actually in, queued up in my Audible. I didn't really realize that he wrote I listened that. to his uh, Hidden Brain episode that was uh, pretty recent. So he's an author, researcher kind yeah. of guy. Okay. I, I think he's a professor. Professor? I think. Don't quote me on that, but I, I think he is. I mean, I, I, I like him and, and I like his stuff, and I've always found it to be like pretty on point. <laughs> And I feel like he's had like his finger on the pulse of like what's he's happening. He's a psychologist. Uh, okay. Uh, like kind of at a societal level, psychologically with people, and it's been like super interesting. Um, but yeah, he he basically, you know, excerpt, we're now in a world where in which preteens spend five hours a day on screens, and teenagers spend eight hours nuts, and they're not thriving. Rates of depression and anxiety for American adolescents increased over fifty percent. From 2010 to 2019, suicide rate from children 10 to 14 it tripled, 2007 to 2021. Uh, in wow. this article, he recommends. Oh, he also has a book. I, f- I forget the name of the book, but uh, he recommends no smartphones before high school, no social media before 16, uh, phone-free schools, more independence, free play, responsibility in the real world. I think he's like advocated like laws, like to the effect yeah. actually like banning full abstinence, social media. So before. one of the things that children also lack today, apparently, I had no idea, never even thought about such a concept, was the lack of time alone entertaining themselves, playing alone, oh, yeah. entertaining but, themselves. Did you, like, that deficiency has caused a huge psychological issue for them. Wait, I'll, I'll raise you one more. So, raise me. So, so my lovely girlfriend, Amber... Um, you know, she works with, uh, she works with children with like autism and all, all sorts of, you know, kind of, uh, mental behavioral disorders. She's a saint. Y- yes, she is. And she said one of the craziest things now is that like, like I wasn't aware of this, like the kids, like they don't, they don't have like grip strength and like dexterity in their hands because they're just like poking stuff. Like they're not like climbing trees or like wrestling and Whoa. stuff you said like they literally like don't like she, she, she they've she, lost that yeah there's like an epidemic of like children with like no grip strength like they what? can't like is this a personal observation for us or people commented on this did she read yeah, about it this as well is like Can a I thing about it more I, i'm sure it's like a thing that's known in the profession that's but it, yeah, it's they're like not playing thing. on the monkey bars we're, devo- and like, yeah, we're they're devolving they're just like are we evolving monkeys or it's like, devolving? It's like Wally, right? Where they're just kind of just oh, drifting through, like on the conveyor belt, just like yeah. tapping stuff. Um, it, it, it's a real thing, I guess. Um, but I, I, I brought this up because I thought it would be interesting to get your take on it, since you have like a youngin and mm. like. Uh, oh, I'll be very um, sort of clear around this topic. Do you have the the emotional fortitude? No, I say Super. yes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> I literally say yes to everything. Um, but I'd like to believe that I will prevent her girl. from having a phone until high school. I think those sort of like rules that Jonathan Haidt laid out are really fair and simple. And Ooh, you know, I don't. No? No. 
you on social media as a nine year old? No, I think those rules are fucking ridiculous. Okay. No, I think like. So do you believe in the opposite or something else? No, I just think that uh, like he's talking about like having government regulation against children under 16 or whatever. That's because parents need help. They don't have the ability like, okay, so what I actually interesting. I I asked you this. I just said, I'm going to stand very firm in my ability to prevent this. And then you guys asked, are you sure? And I said, yeah, probably not because I say (laughs) yes to everything. Parents seem to need, this is an interesting question. We talk about often on this podcast, the, um, and as friends, we talk about this like belief that we don't need intervention from the outside. Is this potentially an area where the issue is so important and you, you have such low leverage that you do require intervention and policy from the outside in order to look at your child and say, I'm sorry, honey, like crazy. I, mean, I don't have a choice. And they the government also don't said see so. other kids with, I mean, exactly. Two, so you're not missing yeah. out. There's no FOMO. None of you can have it. You can't have it. And even if I wanted to, daddy Biden says you can't. So, you know, <laughs> grandpa Biden I mean, that's crazy. won't let you. Bowden, sir. That's Bowden, crazy. Bowden. Yeah. Jew, Joe Joe Biden. Biden. Bowden. Joe Biden. Bowden. So, I mean, I made the argument a few episodes ago that not the government not banning TikTok, but I think this is the best argument against what I made is that you know, if you kind of get away the like game theory of like kids, like, but everyone in my school has it and they're just, the FOMO is so intense. They'll be relentless about it. Um, if you get it away for parents, it, it does, it will lead to the end result of potentially kids not having social media accounts until age 18 without adult like consent. I don't know if I'm fully on board, but I'm curious where you're. So I listened to the to the Hidden was. Brain episode. Uh, I forget this guy, Jonathan Haidt, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I listened to Hidden Brain, and he and he goes through his like five pillars. One is like banning uh, smartphones, and he's like do away with social media and all these things. And he, and like number four was like, and encourage play, real yeah. play, like real life play with each other. And I'm like, well, just fucking do that. And then you don't have to do any other stuff because like when we grew up, we grew up without social media and without internet and we played with each other. So just have them play with each other. And then in the house, you can like have parents moderate whatever social media exists. I have social media. I moderate it myself. I'm fine. Are you guys okay? Like I moderate my, my social media use. Can you moderate your child's? Probably. I, I don't know. Edmund in the chat kind of tends to disagree. He says, I have to find uh, stuff for them to do, build a Lego, play a board game, play tag, left on their own, clueless. He says, <laughs> not going to happen, Armand. Uh, but, but I'm sorry, makes- I want to clarify this with Edmund. Like, if phones and technology didn't exist the way it did for you and I, Edmund, growing up, would they have that problem? So if they didn't know that that option was available, would this be a problem? Are they clueless because they know there's a phone or a tablet they can play with and they're demanding it? Or do they literally not know how to have fun anymore? If they don't know how to have fun anymore, I mean, back to you, Eric, it's like, well, then how do you solve that? Well, I think like, that's my point. Like, you know, Jonathan hates pillar number four was like, get back to real play. But which Edmund, but which Edmund if, points out, he said, build a Lego, play yeah, a board game, play the tag. The burden is on him. Like, we just played because we just thought it was natural. I mean, to be fair, I, I watched option. plenty of TV and I played plenty of video games, but I also played a ton of soccer and I also climbed a lot of trees and I played baseball outside with my neighbors and I rode my bike and I BMXed. I did all of it. You it played wasn't baseball? a problem. Hmm? You played baseball? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, but yeah. you didn't have anything else to deal with. Right. Yeah. But I think that's my point. It's like, just do that stuff and focus that instead right, of. But the point is that, like, this other stuff is so fucking overwhelming. The that vanity they metrics can't... of social media. But I don't need the government to tell. Okay, like, I totally understand this, like, government nanny state take, right? Like, so don't I, let I am the correct. government. Edmund is confirming is like, they're lost because the phone and tablet has been a constant yeah. in their life, unfortunately. They know it's there. They, 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 and also once likes, like if you guys can go back to the moment you first remember getting a Facebook account, 
I said, who uses Facebook? Well, it used to be us. Remember the first moment when you posted something? We all did. No one escaped that and started to get likes. And a little dopamine that hit. That changed everything. Your entire uh, sort of relationship with reality changed. You had a completely new relationship. You had an online identity, and then you had an offline identity. And what has happened to, as Edmund is illustrating to his children, is their mm -hmm. online identity has taken so much importance and precedence that they don't know what to do with themselves in the offline real world anymore because all they can think about is what's possible in the online world. And so you can't entertain yourself anymore. Look, what are you going to do? Look, to... To, to Eric's point, right? Like, if you live in a world where, like, we think it's okay, and maybe you don't think this, but, like, we've accepted that it's okay that the government, like, makes it a law that you wear a seatbelt in your car. This is, like, the ultimate, like, who are you hurting but yourself, right? There's no kind of consequences to your action, like, right? You're just, you're just killing yourself, right? We're like, that's okay. We like accept that it's okay for the governments to do things in the case of like the environment, right? There's sort of like a collective action problem. There is like a bit of a collective action problem here. And I think like Height makes this case in his book. He's basically like, look, if you actually survey these kids, right? And you ask them like, do you want to get rid of like social media? But they, they're like, no, right? But then if you're like, would you like it if nobody else had social media and then you didn't, then they're like, yeah, that would be kind of good. Right. So there's almost this like intractable problem at hand, which is that like right now, if you deny your kids social media, you're like unplugging them from this thing that they can see going on all around them and they're not a part of it. And it's probably like very, very painful. Yeah. And they're unpopular. Yeah. And then okay. like, but like if nobody else can do it, then they don't feel that FOMO. Right. 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 I mean, it's a good argument for this intervention. Okay. Well, I don't know that I agree with that, by the but way. Like, what, I'm just saying if I've ever thought of an argument for outside intervention, even you said it, Nick, like this could be one where it makes sense. Because if you take it away from everybody, then you take away the FOMO that exists for the child in the first place. Of that's like, fine. I need to be part of this. I mean, like, I can agree with that, that that does solve that issue that way. But I don't think that these things are things that need to be banned. Like these like social media thing, these tools were first initiated as a way to help connect. And like I use them that way, like my like high school peer group or whatever are like, we're still Facebook friends and the people that I like worked with in Australia are still connected via that thing. And that's fine. And like, I use it in a way that is not destructive to my life. And I think that's probably the, the desired outcome is to like have it be a way to connect, not be a way to, disconnect which is the way that's being used today so to ban it outright i don't think is the right okay, solution but you so it doesn't also, you so also me, use I don't you also forget this it do, it's not possible for this generation it's they impossible. were born into it it's impossible you were not born into it they can't moderate their use no no no, no. no no there's a more simple explanation here too right like you are able to drink this whiskey and moderate your use of it you don't think it's okay to give it to a 10 year old right even though you know how to moderate and do it, right? It's the, it, it's like a similar principle, I think. It's like, it's like alcohol is like crack for the mind, right? Maybe you can use crack responsibly as a 36 <laughs> year old, 38 year old. I don't know how old you are. You look so young. You older than you are, pal. You also, are, older, oh, you also are projecting a, a, an Ericism, <laughs> which is your ability to moderate. Right. You, 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 you have the ability to moderate all things, you aren't an addict. Uh, uh, in general speaking, but a lot of people don't have your ability to govern. Right. And their... so, so like, let's just use that analogy again. And mm -hmm. like we would say, then the government bans alcohol use entirely. We've tried that. We're well, not advocating for no, banning they all banned alcohol media. use for people above 21. Like, or you below know, that, 21. Uh, yeah, yeah there's well, a ton of stuff we banned. No, they like banned it entirely specific. in prohibition. Yeah, we're talking about the prohibition piece. I mean, <laughs> we banned it entirely. You definitely can't drink it before 21 ever, but we banned it for adults. Uh, that it still has always been illegal for people under 21 because it's just simply. I just don't think like I think that. Anything can be dangerous and it's just how you use them is what makes them dangerous and it's like on the individuals to use them properly. 
Okay, my, my main concern here isn't so much this. It's just like, imagine a scenario in like the 80s or 90s where like people were using computers and they're doing stuff on the internet and games. And then the government was like, these computer things are way too dangerous. And they just banned them for use, like for everybody under the age of like 18. And then your society had like an entire generation of people, like nobody knew how to code or something, right? And then you grew up in a world of computers and nobody knows how to code. And then this thing that you passed with like ideas of benevolence in your heart, just like totally turbo fucked your whole society. I don't know if like, I there's like unforeseen consequences for stuff you might do, which is kind of like the main thing. We're not I'm hitting at the about. root of this. People All right, hit me, man. are unhappy. Lean back. Lean back. Just go like, we're not. We're not. We're, we're actually not getting to the core. <laughs> we're not. You want to go one deeper? Yeah, one deeper. Go deep, baby. Like, come just, on, man. Like, just put it deep inside me. percent <laughs> increase teenage girls committing suicide? Are you... T- are you fucking kidding me? What an absolute heartbreaking disaster of a situation. Let's get real. Let's get serious here. Like, so let's, this is a okay. problem. Let's get real about that. Let's yeah, get real about it's that. A problem. No, no but like, wait, wait. clearly, <laughs> no, it has on. to do. Like, I know that you know it's a problem. Hold on. But to say that there can be self governance amongst a generation of children is absurd. Let's talk about that. It's not going to happen. Let's talk about that specific silo. So I think what's driving that, and you know, I could be wrong, but I think Jonathan Haidt talks about this. He says like, one element that's driving that is you get um, comparativism on a global scale, right? So you have like young girls who are um, now comparing themselves to everybody on earth. Where I used to to only go to school. Where I used to be just within my middle school or whatever. Now it's everybody on earth. So do you think that banning social media is going to solve that problem? Or do you think that still having internet access, which we would still require them to have probably to be a human being, do you think that would be solved? Or do you think they would still be comparative with internet access because i probably think they would i, I think mean, it's the difference between like do you have a bar where you exactly. have whiskey or do you walk around with a handle in your pocket like all the time like i i feel like there's a there's a there's like a compromise yeah. there i think the accessibility it's like, what will they ban yeah the accessibility like, can they see a video on youtube that illustrates what life is like in another city Yes. It was pretty easy for my parents to like gate the contents like I viewed when we had like one computer like in the living room and that was like the only access to the Dude, it's like how I said in like one or two episodes ago, it's like having a black box with fuzzy porn versus having it in your pocket in 4K. But this is going to get super whack. Like if in the future we all have chips in our brain, right, and the people become super advanced, then some people are going to be like, well, I should put the chip in my kid's brain because he's going to be way sicker than all the other kids because they won't have chips. Yeah. And then you're going to be like, no, I don't want to chip my kid's brain. And then, But then he's just like getting circles run around him by all the kids who have internet in their heads. But then like, what do you, how do you censor those kids? I mean, this, this is probably question. getting like way over the, no, way that's, over the edge that's now. That's an but, important and terribly difficult question. But it's like, it's like, it's kind of like what we're talking about right now, taking to the logical conclusion, right? Like if you ban your kid from having a cell phone, like they'll never become like a YouTube influencer as like a child, right? And maybe that's actually like a big deal. Like maybe a future society like really values that. Like, I mean, it, it, it's been something that gets valued higher and higher and higher. And we kind of poo poo it as like a dream, but maybe that's like kids like being in tune to like what future society like really wants. And if you, it's kind of like chopping your kid off from being able to code by banning them from computers. I don't know. My like first question of this whole thing, not not to play devil's advocate, but like genuinely uh, serious question is: when you tell me that grip strength is decreasing, are we devolving or evolving? Is technology I had that and question this, too, and this like um, exposure to it? Uh, a positive trade-off right do we need to suffer the consequences of more anxiety and depression to evolve yeah it's an insane question no i i I actually had the same question insane question but it's a real question i thought this this might be our trajectory to the next phase of human evolution i i don't know but as a human that is not transhuman i was not born into like this transhumanist world where i'm infused with technology from the moment i'm born i have an inclination to want to defend the rights of the analog world and like touching grass i believe in touching grass it's like a meme in crypto that meme is going to go away for the next generation 
is is this just a natural path though? Like we were kind of like silverback gorillas at one point, and then we became these little bullshit things, right? And now we're like, oh my god, we don't have grip strength. Yeah, we also can't maul like a room full of fifty people by yourself anymore, and that's kind of and, whack. And you can yeah. hit a one by one pixel with your thumb at like at command. Yeah, <laughs> that is your. And like yeah. my my cute little my cute little Aussie <laughs> used to be a fucking wolf with like razor sharp fangs. You right, like dude. kill things. You, this Run is the, the this is the cliff. one like, deeper. This is the that's one the evolution. Is, is this baby. Is, is it? Yeah. Is this evolution for everything? Like but, as everything becomes more domestic, do we, it gets like weaker. And but why should it come at but the it's cost barbelled. of of happiness Ooh. and and mental health? Shouldn't we be able to progress physically, metaphysically, spiritually, emotionally, all at the same time? Like <clears> why why? Is this the dark ages? Like we had a we had an episode right, maybe. we had an episode uh, like probably four months ago asking if this was like the technological dark ages, and the, I think the reason where that might stand is like we're evolving constantly, we're moving forward, but people are getting left behind, and maybe maybe we progress to a level where we can like bring all those people up to at least like minimum subsistence, which would be like UBI, which I think we're going towards. <laughs> it just puked inside my mouth. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even, uh, I'm not even putting value on it. I'm just saying like, yeah, what do I might think be is inevitable, man might be inevitable. Well, before we wrap up, I want to get some of the chat in here. So Tom and Nam says, shit, I deal with this myself. And as an adult, kids are so vulnerable. Um, yeah. He also continues to say, we gave an ultra potent drug with unlimited access to kids and incentivized parents to rely on it. Edmund says, Eric, take taking a phone slash tablet from a child who is so used to having it is like watching a crackhead go through withdrawals. Um, we should probably take it away from the child. From the beginning? No, at time. Like, Edmund, I don't know what it's like, dude. I don't have a kid. I don't have any kids. You have two kids. But like... I know that there are kids out there who are able to moderate their usage because I have friends who are parents who do, like, given a lot of time for these things. You're just trying to push for balance? Yes. And and not government intervention. Like, not government stated balance. Like I think I I'm know. coming around to this government intervention argument, which I don't you want found, to. You found a use but case? But, like, I, no, I, I just think I'm, like... Why do we have government? Why don't you just let your, stop your kids from smoking cigarettes when they're 12? I think it's more like, common for more parents to be at a point where they have realized that they don't have control to the level and, and they don't have control. They don't even have influence to the level that they wish they would have that they need help. But here's a good. That's I know that's difficult to think. I'm not at that point. I got a one year old. Didn't uh, I can't imagine what it's like to have a twelve year old who will not listen to me to support you guys. Didn't uh, China ban video games for like yeah. kids? M mostly, like uh, it put like for super strict like time allotment. They, time banned, allotment. they fucking ban video games. And they so change. I feel like they changed like the equivalent of the TikTok algo so that it just showed mostly like math and stuff and not. Oh. <laughs> that's a conspiracy. Like, is that real? That shit's real. I'd like to know <laughs> what you guys like. Just, just play it out. Fact check I, me, bro. I, I just want to know, like, with this argument of what social media usage means for for children. If you had a child, um, middle school, or entering that phase where they were like, "Daddy, Daddy, can I have a phone? Can I have social media? What do you, what do you do?" I think I'm, I'm no different than than like Edmund here, and also most of my friends who have kids who are reaching the age where they see their parents holding this like magical device that clearly draws their attention and you know you're at a restaurant with like a screaming fucking kid throwing a tantrum and you know if you give him this pill yeah. called the tablet <laughs> all will be good like i don't imagine myself being any better than that like and that that is kind of like not doesn't sit well with me um so maybe i'm coming along to the intervention from top down part but it'd be so much easier if you're like ah, oh, my hands are tied I'm sorry. You don't want to go to jail now, do you, little Jimmy? You guys are nuts. All right. <laughs> you guys are nuts. Um, and everyone you know, else is... I want to know, oh. Steven. Yeah, what are you going to do? I don't know. I actually have thought about this a lot, and I don't have a good answer. Because, no. like, on the one hand, like, I actually worry about stunting their growth for, like, a future world in a way that I'm not comprehending currently. 
Yeah. Like if I just like unplug them from what is going to be like a sort of network society and I just unplug them from the network when they're like five and they grow up to be like, they just can't operate because the, everybody else is so much more advanced. Like I worry about that. Even if there was a 7% chance you know, they might so go down depression or suicide. But that, like, but that's why like, I think it would be better if the whole society just collectively <laughs> just downgraded itself. You guys like, are talking right, about nobody, it. It's so weird. Like, nobody advances. The fact that you want to unplug them entirely is not. Not entirely. Happen. Just saying like no social media on the phone. Right. But to have that be government mandated, I, I'm their father. Like you're just not going to have it. I fucking pay for that. Like, are you you're not going to have it. Were yeah. you not a teenager? Do you not remember what it was like? What are they going to do? You do whatever the fuck you want. You find a way. Dude. <laughs> yeah, pal. Did you not? Are they going to fucking not? No, he, he oh, waited till on. he was 18 to look at porn in the internet. Are you serious? You didn't just do what you wanted when your parents told you not to of do course, it? Of course, but there are, there are <laughs> rules and boundaries with which you operate. And then you like, I did everything my parents the rules. told me not to do. No, but here's the deal. If you set the rules here, then the kids go here. If you set the rules here, then the kids go here. If you set the rules here, then the kids go here. So, okay. like, you set the boundaries where you want them, and then the kids tiptoe outside of those boundaries. So, if you set you set the bound, you're saying set okay. the boundaries tight. They'll be like not too far off on whatever you want to set the boundaries tight on. I'm not going to be a tight boundary guy on everything, but on things that I want to be tight Do you on. Agree we, we all know that, your your wife Mina is going to be the the fucking. Oh uh, yeah, she's, she's going to lay down the law. Uh, she's smack Do people. you yeah. agree that some children didn't don't react to the laws the way that perhaps you did, which was to only slip, uh, step slightly outside of the boundaries, but to actually go like fuck you, dad, and go the opposite direction completely. You've seen that. Of course I've seen that. Right. So like that's what's scary about the whole thing. It's like, what do you do? So I'm going to ask for daddy government for help. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not answer. necessarily arguing for that. I am asking the questions around like, I hate it, but I am where Steven is. I'm like, am I actually even doing the right thing? No, I'm going to handle I'm shit on my own, dude. I don't need the government. Questions. I'm going to handle it on my own. I don't need the government's help. I'm not even asking the questions about like, whose help do I need? I'm actually asking the questions of like, what's right? I don't even know which one's right. I don't even know is the cost benefit worth the 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 the, the mental difficulties and um, things that come at a cost of like being a technology native citizen of the world. Like that's just sad to me that like some kids would be left out and not evolve at the pace that every, of everyone else in a YouTube first world. Dude, it's like, for it's, example, it's like nuclear. It's like exactly like nuclear proliferation. And then you're the dad that like held right. your child back from like evolving yeah. and like if everybody succeeding. agrees to just not get more nukes then it's fine if nobody gets more nukes right exactly. but if you're like we're gonna be we're gonna hold our country back from getting nukes because it's bad and then everybody else gets more nukes you're like oh shit i'm fucked you have to it would been way better if everybody just <laughs> agreed no more nukes right i like the social it's media a it's a collective action nuclear problem. proliferation analogy. It is. that's a good analogy See what it's like to do, like give a little recognition to your friend when they say something interesting. I'm processing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not there yet, but I acknowledge that it might exist. Uh, that's in the interesting. Future. Yeah, I might use that. Uh, I think the the stats on the podcast go up when you guys argue more. Yeah, I've heard that. I might. I might think. I've that. heard that's um, a typical social media. Well, yeah. <laughs> all right, we're getting long in the tooth here, so let's let's wrap this up. Um, I thought it was fun today, boys, and the Woodford really did, did a proper job, Eric. Thank Good you. episode, guys. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Liquor goes deeper. Yeah, Daddy government. For sure. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks everyone government for, for, for Daddy joining. government, signing off. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining us live. If you haven't already, please like the video. Um, a lot of us joining live today, both on YouTube and Twitter. I still don't understand what happened on Twitter. You had like uh, 300 viewers on there. Yeah, that was crazy. That's good. good. That's good. Let That's them, good. Let them, let them good have their stream. fun. Okay. Um, yeah, all the links are at alphaalphapod.com. Tomorrow, Thursday at 5 p.m., uh, Eric and Steven are going to do a money-only podcast called Irresponsibly Long. Get in some charts, get in some fundamentals on all your favorite uh, Maybe we'll stream crypto and trad fight tokens. Are buying this dip, Steven? Well, tune in tomorrow. Tune okay. in tomorrow. Good, good <laughs> tease. Um, yeah, everyone, we'll see you next week, 5 p.m. PST on Wednesday. We love you lots. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Adios. Adios.